I'd like to tell you a story. This is Reaper, a digital audio work table, or a doll for short. Anytime I stop recording something, whether it was 5 seconds or 5 minutes, Reaper creates a WAV file and stores it in a special directory. This directory also happens to be the default for project files and renders. I don't like scrolling through 5,000 audio files just to find the finished product, so I moved that somewhere more convenient. One day, I forgot to pay tribute to Todd Howard, so he sent a curse onto my household. I transferred the file into the folder I normally do, only to come back several hours later and be greeted with a message telling me that the file couldn't be located. I figured this might happen, since I imported it to the editing software before moving it, since it has to spend half a day conforming the audio, except when I went to relink the file, I couldn't find it. So, I checked my recycling bin, except I'd already emptied it. So I panicked. I just spent four and a half hours the night before recording a majority of the script and didn't want that to be for nothing. I downloaded a software to see if the file could be recovered, and it told me that not only was it unrecoverable, the file location couldn't even be identified, whereas everything else I deleted could. I tried recovering all the individual clips and loading the project file into Reaper to see if I could simply re-render the audio, except the file names are changed during the recovery process, so Reaper couldn't identify them. Like a Vegas man who never learned when to walk away, I had lost it all. So, what did we learn? Well, for starters, Windows is a shit operating system that has plagued my PC since I bought it, and this is the incident that will push me towards looking into Linux. I know for a fact that I moved the file into the folder I wanted it in, and considering that the recovery software can't locate the last known location of the file, I'm convinced that this wasn't a repeat of the Fable 3 incident where I deleted my backup files that turned out to be my primary files. More importantly, we learned that backups are important, and I should make several copies of my project file just in case. My PC has limited hard drive space, but a RAR file in Google Drive will go a long way in situations like this. Hopefully, I'll never have to do something like this again. But who actually knows? What I just described, this personal experience of mine, could be defined as emergent storytelling. It's the type of stories that are unique to a single person at a single moment in time, and video games are the greatest source of them, but Daggerfall is greater than most. There's a specific story in this game that falls outside the main narrative, and it's your story. It's the story of how you learned about the game more and more as you played, and how you became stronger and more knowledgeable alongside your character. Daggerfall does a great many things, but the most memorable things about my playthrough weren't plot-related. They were much more personal than that. You'll hear more about these moments later in this video, so I suppose I should talk about what exactly it's about. In this video, I'll be taking a closer look at Daggerfall and its systems to find out what makes it so special. The game has generally fallen out of the public eye until recently, but even then, not many fans of the Elder Scrolls franchise have even heard of the game, and even fewer have actually played it. Despite this, it's managed to gain a strong following of fans who still believe it to be the best installment in the franchise, and I want to know why that is. I'd also like to take a moment to let everybody know that this video isn't going to follow my usual formula of analysis. Those of you who are familiar with how I cover games might find the structure to be a little bit off. This is a very big game, and I can't consolidate everything about its gameplay like I can for a more linear experience like Metro or God of War. Some sections will go into greater detail than others, but this will also be a very anecdotal analysis. Daggerfall is one of of those games where a lot of the fun stems from the experience itself, and I think sharing some of my favorite experiences while playing the game will help express that a little more. Things usually feel a lot less structured in writing than they tend to be in the final product, but I still like to let everybody know that if it seems like I'm rambling on about something unimportant, don't worry, there is a point to it. I also have a couple disclaimers to make before we get started. It wasn't until after I started this project that I heard about Daggerfall Unity, which is a recreation of this game in the Unity engine. I considered doing a review of that specifically, but I think that topic is a little oversaturated on YouTube as it is. More importantly though, I felt like it would be inauthentic to review a recreation of the game. I wanted to know what it was about Daggerfall that people loved, and that meant I needed to play the game that they fell in love with. The original version. The game is free to download and already set up on the Bethesda Game Launcher, but for whatever reason this caused problems with OBS. Despite the fact that the game is showing full resolution on my monitor, OBS was only recording the game's true resolution, that being 320x200. None of the solutions I read online fixed the problem because I was going through the launcher, so I ended up having to install the game through DOSBox itself. It was a little bit of a headache to get everything set up, but eventually it was as simple as C colon CD dagger dagger and you're in the game. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I didn't think to check the unofficial Elder Scrolls wiki, which by the way is probably the best wiki I've ever seen in my life, for additional patches that weren't included in the launcher version. There are several patches that added content and fixed numerous game-breaking bugs that I didn't install because I didn't know about them. So my experience 
experience was significantly buggier than it actually needed to be. Some of the issues were caused by conflictions with DOSBox itself, but most of them were just because I was playing on a barely patched version of the game. The bugs were so frequent that I thought I was experiencing input lag when in reality my wireless mouse was dying. In my defense, I changed the batteries three times before I finally switched to a wired one, but the point is that I couldn't tell if it was the game or not. I know that Bethesda is essentially synonymous with bugs by this point, but I felt like you should know how my experience was with the game since I'll be bringing these issues up later in the video. I didn't encounter anything game breaking until literally the last 15 minutes of the playthrough where I couldn't finish the final dungeon. More on that later. I will take a moment to talk about some of the more general issues I experienced. 90% of the bugs I encountered were audio glitches. My horse's running sound was almost always nothing but static, and the only reason I'm able to say almost is because there was a single moment where the sound played normally, except it also wouldn't stop playing when I quit moving, so it was broken regardless. There were the thousands of times that Mick Gordon possessed my game and started writing new music. This was usually triggered when a torch or a fireball would glitch out and cause a feedback loop. It actually scared the shit out of me the first few times it happened, but it was always entertaining afterwards. Why spend $200 on an audio synthesizer when you can just play Daggerfall for a few hours and have enough samples to make sure that Daft Punk never considers writing music again? Despite that, I've had songs get stuck on specific notes like the musicians were improvising. Sometimes it would fix itself and other times it wouldn't. Keep in mind that because of the type of game that Daggerfall is, things don't reset after loading a save or quitting the game. If you receive a bugged quest, it's like that for the rest of your playthrough. Other common bugs include falling through elevators after pausing your game. This can also be achieved by casting Levitate, but essentially what happens is the game freezes your character in place whenever you do certain actions like pause or open your spellbook, and whenever you resume, the elevator has clipped into your character model which causes you to fall through. This is really annoying because if you're riding the elevator and hear enemies then go to queue a spell for the fight, then you'll end up falling to your death. If you're a habitual saver like I was, you might instinctively save when you're on an elevator and fall to your death. So if you don't have a save prior to that and you can't cast levitate or slow falling, then you just put yourself in a death loop. I've also had the awkward scenario where an elevator would put me on top of an enemy. This also happened to me with levitate one time. Since all NPC models are 2D sprites, including yours, if you land on top of an enemy then you won't be able to see them. You can't step off of them because they move at the same time you do, so unless you have an AoE spell, then you're not going to be able to hit them. The downside to this is that they can still hit you. So if you're a melee build and you weren't able to progress through a mandatory portion of a dungeon because of this bug, then you have my sympathies. This is one of those bugs that has the potential to be game breaking depending on the circumstance. If you happen to land on top of, say, a Daedra Lord, then you're probably going to die too quickly for you to actually do anything. Even if you play a character that has ranged abilities like archers, the camera usually restricts you from looking directly down in the game, so you won't be able to just snipe them from a safe distance. This only happened to me twice, thankfully only dropping me on top of low-level enemies like centaurs and rogues, but I think the fact that it happened more than once at all is an issue. Needless to say, Vanilla Daggerfall is a very buggy game, but most of the bugs aren't game-breaking. With that discussion out of the way, let's go ahead and move on to a more general topic. What kind of game is Daggerfall? Modern Bethesda titles like Skyrim and Fallout 4 have no real comparison beyond each other. The reason that so many people simply refer to them as Bethesda games is because it's the most accurate description of what you can expect from them. You have an open world environment that you can explore at your leisure. You accept quests from people that send you to clear out one of the game's several dungeons where you're guaranteed to find a stockpile of loot, and then you return to the quest giver to collect your reward. This is the core gameplay loop of these games, and it's something I think Bethesda does very well. But more importantly, it's what defines these games. Daggerfall shares some of the same DNA as these games, but the experience isn't as comparable as you would think. Daggerfall is actually much closer to a different game entirely, Mountain Blade Warband. For those of you who haven't played it, Warband is a historically realistic medieval action RPG that has a lot of the same elements as Daggerfall, although they're not identical. They share a similar kind of quest design, but the biggest similarity, and the reason I'm using this example, is the level of world simulation. Both Warband and Daggerfall use procedurally generated content for the purpose of making money and increasing your reputation. Daggerfall has some more unique and interesting quests, but most of them don't come from the guilds that you work for. A majority of the quests in the game are unremarkable, but there are a few exceptions I'll get to while discussing gameplay. The level of simulation between these games isn't a one-to-one -one comparison either, but the level of depth is. 
Warband is an interesting game because you could completely remove the player and the world will continue on without you. The individual kingdoms will continue to start wars and sign treaties, the economy will fluctuate depending on how these wars play out, and the players on the field will continue to do their own thing. Castles will be sieged, feasts will be distributed, Harless will continue to host feasts regardless of how badly the Swadians are losing their war, lords will defect to other kingdoms, and all of this happens regardless of your existence. Daggerfall doesn't do any of these things, but what it does has been given just as much consideration in a simulated just as well. Here are a few examples. If you commit a crime in Daggerfall and get caught by the guards, then you have your choice of surrendering or fighting. If you surrender, you're taken to court, where you can either lie or debate your charges. If the dice roll in your favor, then you can be acquitted and set free. If not, you go to jail for your allotted time. Quests in this game have time limits, so going to jail for two weeks can cause you to fail them and lose reputation with the quest giver. Let's say that you want to summon a Daedra to get a hold of their artifacts. You can't just walk up to the Shrine of Azura and become her champion like in Skyrim. You need to join a faction that offers Daedra summoning services like the Mages Guild or one of the local temples, then work your way up in the ranks to be granted access to that privilege. Certain temples won't summon certain Daedra that they're at odds with because it goes against their religion. Once you get the required rank, the base cost for summoning a Daedra is 200,000 gold, but you can't carry that much money. Gold has weight in this game, so you need to deposit the money into a bank and get a letter of credit. Each bank only operates in its respective region, so if all your money is in the Bank of Daggerfall, you're not making a withdrawal in Wayrest. So you approach the summoner, money in hand. But hold on a moment. Do you really think that you get to just summon a Daedra whenever you want, like they're beholden to your schedule? Daedra will only allow you to summon them on specific days unless you use a Witch's Coven, but don't think that your summoner is going to provide this information. You better head over to the local library and start hitting the books. But don't expect to find one titled Daedra Summoning and Daedra Summoning Accessories. If you want to learn the day to summon a Daedra without asking your summoner every single day of the year until you get one right, you need to find a topic related to what the Daedra represents first. For example, if you want to summon Sheogorath, read The Madness of Pelagius and pay attention to any dates it brings up. You'll find one at the end of the story where the author describes the holiday of Mad Pelagius, where general foolishness is encouraged. If you've done the Sheogorath quest in Skyrim, then this one is obvious considering Pelagius is the focus of it. So you could argue that this one is easy. What if you want to summon Nocturnal? Well, you won't find a book title that will immediately give it away, but read enough lore books and you'll find the story of Greywash, which gives a date in the beginning of the story and directly references Nocturnal at the end. Alright, so now you have the date, the coin, and the means to summon a Daedra. You walk up to the summoner, pay them the coin, and get told that the Daedra isn't interested in speaking with you. You didn't really think they were obligated to answer your summon, did you? Depending on your reputation with the Daedra, they can and will ignore you, and it's for this reason that I never successfully summoned one. Hey guys, Shrimp and Post here. I went back to get footage of me getting rejected by a Daedra because I didn't want to scroll through all 56 hours of footage to find the example when it happened previously, and I was actually able to successfully summon Boethia. I initially went on to say that if you reject a Daedra's quest, then they send Daedric enemies at you for 3 in-game hours, but I missed some fine print in the UESP that says there's only a marginal chance of this actually occurring. I didn't do the quest because I've already completed the playthrough, but I was able to at least get some footage of a successful summon. That's all I really had to say, so back to the video. Even if you were able to successfully summon a specific Daedra on that day, there's a 5% chance that Sheogorath will appear instead, and if it's thunderstorming, then that's increased to 15%. Daggerfall represents what the Daedra are all about better than any other Elder Scrolls game to date, and unless you decide to use the wiki, then you're on your own to figure things out. This may not be as exciting as Warband Simulation, but I hope you can see from these examples how much effort went into making Daggerfall feel like an actual place more than just a sandbox environment for a video game. Despite that, there are some drawbacks to Daggerfall's world, which is its size. Everybody loves to talk about how big the world of this game is, and it is, but that isn't necessarily a good thing. The space between cities is completely empty, not even having the virtue of interesting visuals to make up for it. I remember the first time I played Warband I was upset that I couldn't explore the overworld in first person, but after seeing Daggerfall's world, I see why it's like that. There's a reason that you fast travel to the dungeon entrance just by typing its name in the travel map, because it would kill the experience if you couldn't. The only reason that Daggerfall's world is this big is because Bethesda set that standard with the first game in the series, Arena. Daggerfall has a lot of towns, villages, and homesteads across various regions of the map, but the only one of those that is visually distinct is the regions. Daggerfall is an impressive world stipulation for its time, but it doesn't have an impressive overworld. The main focus of this game was on its dungeons, so I suppose we should go ahead and address the elephant in the room. 
You may have noticed that I didn't really talk about what you do in Daggerfall, and that's because almost all of it revolves around dungeons. Not every quest in the game will send you to a dungeon, but the more substantial ones will. At its core, Daggerfall is a dungeon crawler that uses procedural generation to achieve it. This is seen in both the quest and the design of the dungeons themselves. The quest will send you there for a number of reasons. You may need to rescue somebody, kill something, or find an item, but all of that will take place in the samey looking dungeons that use specific templates for their bigger environments. There are a number of problems that come from this. For starters, your objective may spawn in an underwater region of the dungeon, and swimming most likely isn't a skill you'll be getting much practice in. In my case, I had a swimming of 3%, which is literally a skill of 3 out of 100. There's a reason that Skyrim has a minimum skill level of 15 at all times, and it's for people like me. To put it bluntly, my character literally cannot swim. So even if I cast Water Breathing, I won't be able to make it to my objective before it wears off, and I drown because the swim skill doesn't only apply to you holding your breath. It applies to the movement speed and water. There's also the issue of your objective spawning in an area that non-magic builds can't get to, but in the 50 plus hours of this playthrough, this never happened to me, except for a single dungeon that I couldn't progress through because of its design. I should also mention that the traps in this game's dungeons are dog ass. They're not really traps, it's more like the floor is lava in certain areas, except there's no visual representation, so you can die without really understanding what's going on. Despite this, I think the design of Daggerfall's dungeons gets a lot of unfair criticism, and I'm going to shock the entire internet with this next statement. I like them. The dungeon design in Daggerfall, yes, even vanilla DOSBox 1996 Daggerfall, is nowhere near as bad as people would have you believe. I'm not going to pretend they're perfect, they have some very obvious issues like the ones I mentioned before, but the amount of hate they receive is so unwarranted. Here's a little story about my experience with Daggerfall Dungeons, and it starts before I even downloaded the game. I watched a couple of videos about Daggerfall whenever I decided to do this project because I wanted to see how other people felt about it. Most people who covered this topic recently played Daggerfall Unity, but I was still able to hear their thoughts on the original and they absolutely trashed the dungeons. Much of their criticism was related to what I mentioned before, quest objectives spawning underwater, unbeatable dungeons, inaccessible areas, etc. I went into this game expecting to hate it, and the game's tutorial dungeon only furthered that. I'll talk more in depth about that dungeon later, but for a brand new player it's extremely unforgiving. You'll hear me say multiple times this isn't a game that holds your hand. After getting through it, I decided to do anything I could to avoid dungeon quests. But as with everything in life, you do things you don't want to when you need money. Of course, I didn't feel comfortable going to just any dungeon, so I decided after I'd gotten some slightly better gear to go back to the tutorial dungeon. After all, I'd spent several hours trying to escape it from the several test characters I made, and it has a static layout, so it'd be the perfect place to get some practice. I went back to the Privateer's Hold, set a checkpoint save at the dungeon entrance in case I ran into anything out of my league, and started making frequent excursions into the dungeon. If my health got too low, I'd return to the entrance, rest up to heal myself, and then set a new checkpoint. It was around the moment that I found my first enchanted armor piece that I started enjoying myself. By making several trips back to the entrance to dump the loot into my wagon and make a fresh checkpoint save, I was forming a mental layout of the place and getting more comfortable wandering the halls. I eventually hit every room that I could find and returned to town, and after selling all my loot for several thousand gold, I realized that dungeon crawling is one of the most enjoyable things about this game. There was a specific moment during my playthrough that I regard as my favorite in the entire game. During one of the Mage's Guild quests, I was sent to a dungeon called Tower Hearthheart. The place was full of zombies, which have an increased chance of giving you a disease if they hit you, and my character has a critical weakness to disease. On top of this, I was weak. I could barely hit anything, and my gear was complete trash. It only took me about 30 minutes to find my objective and to get out, but it was 30 minutes of barely winning a fight and running away to find a place to rest so I could heal. Fast forward 16 hours of playtime later, and I get another quest to this same dungeon. The name sounded familiar, but I didn't recognize it immediately. After walking around for 30 seconds, I realized that this was the same place I'd been to before, and this time went completely different. I had 8 enchanted items fortifying various attributes, an enchanted mithril claymore that cast firestorm on enemies when I hit them, but most importantly, I had experience. I don't mean I was a higher level, I mean I had more knowledge of how the dungeons in this game work. I went from moving through this dungeon at a crawl, barely scraping through each encounter, to striding through the halls, eviscerating anything that stood in my way. This was the moment when I realized that the days of struggling to kill even the most basic enemies are over, but more importantly, it was the moment I realized exactly why I like Daggerfall's dungeons. The dungeons are where your build is put through its paces. It's where you level most of your combat skills and find the best gear. To put it another way, the dungeons are where the progression happens. Most of the learning experience for me came in the form of dungeons, and those first few days of grinding out Mage's Guild quests were some of the most enjoyable I had with this game. 
Procedurally generated dungeons as a concept aren't inherently bad, either. Chalice dungeons are regarded as some of the best content Bloodborne has to offer, and they also use procedural generation for many of them. A lot of people are going to think I'm a psychopath for even daring to praise the dungeons in this game, but I think there's a specific reason why I enjoyed the crawl more than anybody else on the internet. I'm going to start with the reason that I felt was the most apparent, the game's map. Let me get all my criticism out of the way early. The map is crude, difficult to navigate, and very off-putting. Notice that I didn't say that the map sucks. That's because it doesn't. In fact, the map is the most underrated tool that Daggerfall has to offer. The dungeons in this game are elaborate enough to put Daedalus Labyrinth to shame, and if you try to navigate it without using your map then you are making things harder on yourself. A common criticism I've heard on YouTube is people saying that they spent upwards of 4 hours looking for their objective before they found it. I'm not going to pretend like this never happened to me, because it did, but only one time during a story quest, never a random quest. Most people I've heard criticize the dungeons tend to bring up the hidden doors. The hidden doors in this game are very difficult to spot with the naked eye, and these people claim that they don't show up on the map, and they're wrong. Yes, my little shrimplings, it's true. Hidden pathways are revealed on your map. They appear as an unexplored doorway whenever you pass them, but if they don't, you can see that the floor continues beyond the wall. Some are easier to see than others, but the most important thing is that they are shown on the map, and they're very easy to spot if you know what you're looking for. The map in this game has a learning curve, and it will take time to get used to. The reason it looks the way it does is because it's a 3D representation of the entire dungeon. I actually think it's a snapshot of the entire cell from the game's engine, which is why you can usually see things like furniture and decorations while viewing it. If you've ever messed around in Bethesda's creation kits, then you'll notice they look similar, or at least in my case, it looks similar to the one from Fallout New Vegas. The map is a tool that you want to get familiar with, and once you do, you'll realize that it's really not that difficult to navigate. 98% of the hidden doorways I found in this game I found using this map, and I was eventually able to get comfortable enough with it to where I could navigate the entire dungeon with it thanks to the map's compass. If you just cleared a long stretch of hallway and find yourself at a dead end, you should check your map and see if any hidden doorways were revealed along the way. I recommend stopping every few seconds to check the map, make sure you know where you're going, and watch for pathways you might have missed. If this sounds tedious, then don't worry. Just like your parents' divorce, you'll get over it. Giving a bird's eye view of the dungeon helps add a new layer of perspective to where you're going, and it makes the experience feel more like a maze than a walking simulator. If you hear somebody criticize Daggerfall's dungeons for being needlessly complicated while in the same breath talking about how they don't use their map, then you found the problem. If they don't say it directly, but you hear them say they only found a hidden doorway because an enemy was clipping through the wall, then it's likely that they're not using it. I'm not going to criticize anybody for deciding that the map isn't worth their time, because like I said, it's a clunky mess to navigate until you get used to it. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and defend anybody who didn't know that hidden doorways show up on the map, because it's not really their fault. Let's ignore the fact that the very use of the map has a steep learning curve. Let's ignore the fact that the top-down view can be a nightmare to use because textures overlap and form non-existent pathways, and using the arrow keys to navigate the angled view is something even I stopped trying after a while. Let's look at things how they are. The game's own tutorial doesn't even tell you how to access your map until after you've left the tutorial dungeon. The developers were given an opportunity to inform the player about a crucial detail that will save them hours of headache in the future, and they didn't. Can you really blame someone for not knowing this? The way I see it, this isn't a problem with the critics being stupid. This is a failure to properly communicate to the player that the game was designed around the philosophy that they're going to use their map. One of the biggest criticisms that I'm going to lay on this game later is that there's a consistent breakdown of communication during the story dungeons where the developers will include a design that only works if the player is operating on the same wavelength as them. Things aren't as simple as use map avoid headache either. There's still times when you're going to chart out 90% of a dungeon before finding your objective. It isn't always going to be the last place you check, but it's sometimes going to feel like it. I've had dungeons where the objective spawned in the exact same spot of a certain template twice in a row. I've had them spawn a 20 second walk from the entrance, and I've had them spawn in the most obscure locations known to man. This is all just part of the experience, and a longer crawl is only rewarded with more skill level ups and loot. But there are going to be those times when you do spend longer than you want to in the samey looking corridors, and I was always sure to give myself a reasonable break from dungeon crawling whenever I could. Really though, there is another reason that those critics despise the dungeons of this game, and it's something that I started feeling at the end of my playthrough. I mentioned a lot of reasons why I enjoy Daggerfall's dungeons, but notice that not one of those reasons involved actually finding the objective. The procedurally generated dungeons were more fun than the story dungeons because I was never too concerned about my objective while exploring them. Since I knew it could spawn anywhere, I spent my time exploring each area, but my focus was on the loot I'd taken off enemies. When I'm mapping out a dungeon and returning back to my wagon with 80 more pounds of profit, I'm not too concerned when I stumble upon what I'm actually looking for. 
This isn't true for the story dungeons because the only reason I was there was to find the item so I could progress the quest. The story dungeons are different than the random ones. They have a much more deliberate feel to them with some more unique and personal touches sprinkled in. At first glance, this is a good thing, but it actually brings with it a much deeper issue. There are several templates that the procedural dungeons use that appear in the story dungeons, but the handcrafted areas are usually the more important ones, so I'd find myself ignoring them. I'd find myself turning back, saying, I don't feel like it's in here, this feels like the procedural half of the dungeon. This is made worse whenever I would eventually go back and explore those parts just to find out my objective was never even there. It was just a filler half of the dungeon that didn't even need to be there. This makes the story dungeons feel unnecessarily bloated, like they handcrafted half of it and then ran the other half through the dungeon generator when only the first half is related to the quest. Have you ever been looking for something in your house for several hours, knowing that you had just seen it not too long ago but you can't find it when you actually need it? That's how Daggerfall's dungeons can feel when you're only in there for the sake of the objective. It can feel boring, time consuming, but most importantly, it can be frustrating when you can't find it. I never struggled finding my objective for random dungeon quests because that objective was not deliberately placed. So there's the mindset that since it can be anywhere, it's gotta be everywhere. The story dungeons do have their objectives placed in a specific spot, which means there is a specific path you must take in order to find it, and it's never more than a 5 minute walk from the entrance. The Wayrest Castle was the absolute worst dungeon in the entire game, and I'll get into that when discussing the story, but that was the only dungeon that I spent more than 3 hours in. So, with all that being said, I think you can see that I don't really judge anybody who despises Daggerfall's dungeons. People like different things for different reasons, and trying to find a needle in a haystack is frustrating, especially when my haystack was filled with ticks, mosquitoes, and congressmen. I will admit that I was starting to feel dungeon fatigue by the end of my playthrough, and the number that it asks you to go through at times can feel excessive. My main argument here is that Daggerfall has enjoyable dungeons, but it also needs to be acknowledged that not every dungeon in the game is enjoyable. Let's get off this topic and move on to character creation. Deckerfall has a very old school RPG style of character design. You have your 8 main attributes, each one increasing the effectiveness of skills that fall under them. They also have many other qualities. Strength dictates your encumbrance and melee damage. Intelligence dictates how many spell points you're going to have. Willpower dictates spell resistance. Agility determines your hit chance and dodging capabilities. Endurance covers your hit points, healing rate, resistance to poisons and disease, and your fatigue. Personality only governs the skills associated with it, like etiquette and mercantile. Speed governs your general movement speed as well as how quickly you perform actions, and lastly, luck determines every dice roll in the game regardless of what attribute it falls under. If any of these attributes hit zero, usually caused by diseases or poisons, then you die. I never had this happen to me and it's only because of the fountain of knowledge that is the UESP that I know this. When creating a character, you have several options. The first one is going to be your race and gender. Each race has their own special advantage, but I chose Britain for the first time in my Elder Scrolls career because they have a 30% resistance to magic. Spoiler alert, this wasn't enough to prevent vampire ancients from one-shotting me if they got close enough, so I eventually forgot that I even had it. Once you've chosen your race and gender, you get to select your class. You can choose one of the 18 predetermined classes or answer a list of questions for the game to decide what's best for you. Either way, the description of these classes only mentions your skills and you get many more options if you decide to make a custom class, so that's what I did. I'd like to mention now that I went into this game with minimal knowledge of how these things work, so I ended up handicapping myself without realizing it. More on that later. The custom class screen is fairly straightforward when you know what you're doing, but it's intimidating when you're new to the game. So here's a breakdown of how things work. Naming your class is self-explanatory, and I only brought it up so you know that you can do it. You don't have any attribute points to distribute because everything is currently at 50, but you can reduce the ones you think will be less important. Keep in mind that this number only affects your starting value, so this isn't how your stats will look when you start the game. You're given additional attribute points to distribute anytime you level up, so you're probably fine to leave everything as is unless you know exactly what build you're going for. Anything you do on this screen is going to impact your character down the line, but even with my personal handicap that I'll talk about in a moment, I still felt comfortable by the end of the game. Next, you're going to want to select your skills. This is going to have a greater impact on how you level than you would expect. Leveling in Daggerfall isn't as simple as it is in later titles. Morrowind allows you to level up after increasing any combination of your major and minor skills 10 times. Oblivion only requires you to increase any combination of your major skills for a total of 10 points, and leveling skills in Skyrim fills a meter that triggers the level up. Daggerfall is clearly the most archaic method because it follows a formula. The formula itself isn't that complicated, but it's not something that you can work out for yourself while playing unless you wrote down your starting level for all your skills so you can calculate it. Let's be honest, no gamer in 2021 is going to go through that much effort. 
What you should know is that one part of the formula is the sum of your three primary skills, your two highest major skills, and your highest minor skill. Daggerfall isn't a game built for one character, and this system represents that. I selected Destruction, Longblade, and Restoration as my primary skills because it's what I thought I was going to use the most. Had I known how little I was actually going to use Restoration, then I would have selected something that I would be using more often. I then proceeded to pick Alteration, Mysticism, and Illusion as my major skills because I expected to be a dedicated mage. And the only one of these I really used was Mysticism so I could break into stores after hours with the open spell. I never learned how to use lockpicking because I never had a high enough skill to do so. My minor skills were Running, Dodging, Mercantile, Blunt Weapon, Thaumaturgy, and Critical Strike. I used many of these much more than I did any of my major skills. Leveling in the early game was incredibly slow for me because I only frequently used two of my primary skills, so anytime I wanted to trigger a level up it usually resulted in me spamming cheap restoration and alteration spells until the game decided I was ready to progress. This became less of an issue as the game went on, but the first three levels were absolutely brutal. If I were to redo this class, which I might if I end up trying Daggerfall Unity, I would keep Destruction and Longblade as my primaries but swap Restoration with Running, add Jumping to one of my major skills since it's easy to level, and at least add Swimming to my minor skills so my character knew how to do anything in water besides swing a sword and drown. I didn't learn until halfway through my first playthrough that this game has a sprinting feature, and that's because of the game's Neanderthalic default keybinds, so I figured movement speed was dictated by the running skill instead of the speed attribute. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I slowly walked around town in the early game before I had enough money for a horse, because somebody thought P is a good sprinting key. I'll bitch about the keybinds after I'm done with character creation. Once you've selected your skills, you can move on to the special advantages and disadvantages. Unlike Fallout New Vegas, where each trait has a preset stat bonus and penalty that you can't alter, you're allowed to select whatever you want in Daggerfall with the only penalty being slower leveling. If you decide to make a powerhouse character with no disadvantages, then you might max out the skill advantage meter. This is a static difficulty slider that is determined by your advantages and disadvantages. The max difficulty causes your skills to take three times as long to advance, and the easiest means it takes a third of the usual time. This the slider is also controlled by how many hit points you select to receive after each level up. There are a lot of choices in both your advantages and disadvantages, and some of your build's defining aspects are going to come from right here, but if you're not careful, then you're going to cripple yourself in the long run. Let me explain the mistakes I made here on my first attempt. The default number of spell points a character has is 50% of their intelligence. Attributes hard cap at 100, so a non-mage will have a maximum potential of 50 spell points. This is remedied by taking the increased majory advantage, which gives you several options on how you want to multiply your spell points. Your choices are 1.5, 1.75, 2, or 3 times your intelligence into spell points, but the final option simply says intelligence and spell points. Considering that the options were in progress, order, a cluster of neurons misfired in my brain and I thought this was the largest increase. The real reason this is listed last is because your options are in alphabetical order, and because the other options begin with numbers, they were placed above it. What this option does is give you a flat 1 to 1 ratio between your spell points and intelligence, so my maximum potential of spell points was 100. I ended the game with 80 intelligence, but I was able to fortify another 20 through enchanted items, so it wasn't the end of the world. Thankfully, there was another thing I did that balanced this out. The beauty of Daggerfall's advantage system is that you can break the game if you know what you're doing. Like I said, I came into this game with a minimal understanding of its systems, but I was able to pick up on one exploit that I otherwise would have missed. If you take an immunity to a specific element, in my case I chose fire, and you also take spell absorption, then you can point blank spam AoE fireballs that immediately refill your spell points upon impact. I can't cast any ultra lethal spells because of my low mana pool, but I can cast weaker spells repeatedly until the target is dead. As you level your destruction, the cost of spells will go down, meaning that by the end of the game I could launch fireballs that do the same amount of damage as Daedric weapons, except I can spam them faster than you could swing a sword at 100 speed. This basically turns me into a human grenade launcher with the bottomless clip cheat enabled. If you think this sounds like overkill, it isn't. There were several times while playing the main story that I would get one shot by certain enemies, Vampire Ancient specifically. If it weren't for this exploit, I don't think I would have been able to kill those enemies unless I invested in enchanted items that use spell reflection, and if I wasn't a high ranking member of the Mages Guild then I wouldn't have been able to access that feature regardless. You could gain access to it from the Temple of Julianos, but the only non-magic skills you could use to climb the ranks are Impish and Daedric, which are language skills, and Shortblade and Lockpicking. I had none of these. 
To balance out the difficulty slider, you can add disadvantages too. You can take critical weaknesses, which I took disease since I figured I could just cure it with restoration. You can forbid certain weapon types, fighting skills, or weapon materials, and you can take phobias that decrease your weapon accuracy and damage against certain targets. Phobias against animals would probably be the easiest since the only dangerous ones in the late game are giant scorpions and spiders, but even they died in a handful of spells. I figure weapon accuracy doesn't matter when I cast a fireball at the wall and it happens to nuke whatever's standing next to it, but it might play a part. The wiki isn't specific. As you can see, Daggerfall's class creation has an absurd amount of depth that you simply don't see in modern games, but there are obvious choices like the spell absorption exploit from Aegis. Daggerfall Unity took advantages like athleticism, acute hearing, and adrenaline rush and made them much more viable than they were in vanilla Daggerfall, because those skills have no noticeable benefits while playing. You're probably wondering how I could describe this as fairly straightforward whenever you have a million options, but it's really not as complicated once you understand what to take and what to ignore. Daggerfall greatly benefits on your second playthrough because you have all of the knowledge and experience you need to really succeed. Once you've named your class, you can move on to the character's career and background. This is going to determine the starting stats of the skills and attributes you selected. You can go ahead and generate it immediately, but I recommend going through the questionnaire because your answers will determine what equipment you start with. Some of these items are worthless, but you can begin with an extra bit of gold, a better weapon, or some iron armor that will give you a slight edge in the tutorial dungeon, especially since your basic starting weapon isn't going to cut it against most enemies. After completing the questionnaire or randomizing your background, you get to name yourself and choose your face. You're then put in the final stage where you distribute your remaining attribute and skill points. If you want, you can re-roll which will randomize the starting values of your attributes. There's an option to save a roll and reload it if you want to revert back to the previous roll. Just keep in mind that you'll have to manually save the roll you want to load, or just like the first draft of me reading this section, it's gone forever. Once you get your attribute points where you want them, you move on to distributing skill points, which is much more straightforward. I wasn't kidding whenever I said there's a lot to discuss with this game. You can see how deep and robust Daggerfall's character creation is and how many opportunities you have for unique builds. You may or may not be thinking, what do I do if I made a bad character? The answer is simple, just make another one. There's a reason that you're given the option to start a new game every time you die, and it's because the developers knew that you were going to mess up during character creation, or at the very least, select a class that you don't like. The game's tutorial can be completed in a matter of minutes if you know what you're doing, so don't stress too much if you need to start over unless you're a decent way into the story whenever you discover the problem like I was. Until you fully understand how to take advantage of these systems, it's going to be some trial and error, which is why you're given 18 classes to choose from. With that out of the way, let's finally get into the game itself. Two cutscenes are going to play that I'll talk more about during the story discussion, so all you need to know is that you're on an assignment from the Emperor to investigate why the ghost of the former King of Daggerfall is haunting the city. You wake up in a cave with some text on screen explaining your predicament. Your boat was destroyed by a storm. You barely made it into this cave when a mudslide sealed you in. There's a corridor leading out, but it's up to you to find an exit. You are now in the tutorial dungeon. Welcome to hell. The Privateer's Hold is the best and worst tutorial I've ever seen in a game, and both of these for completely different reasons. It's the best tutorial because you can be done with it and in the world in two minutes or less if you know what you're doing, and it's the worst because it's absolutely unforgiving. My very first time playing this game, which was several months before the playthrough you're seeing now, I spent three hours trying to get out of here without any luck. There were a number of reasons for that, but the biggest ones were inexperience in the game's archaic controls. I heavily advise you to take a look at your keybinds before doing anything in this game, because the default controls are abysmal. So the first thing we're going to want to do is try to modernize it. By default, you're in cursor mode, which means you move around by moving your cursor to the side of the screen that you want to move to and then hold left click to walk that direction. The issue with this is that you can't walk backwards very well because the interface is in the way, so your only option in combat is to stand still and take your beating. This makes even the first fight a pain in the ass since you'll be missing this rat a lot before you actually kill it. Thankfully, Daggerfall also features a view-based movement system that requires you to actually push keys to move, but the bindings also don't make any sense. You're somehow expected to use the arrow keys to move, sprint with P, jump with J, and use your mouse to look around all at the same time. I'm not sure if the person in charge of the game's controls were left-handed or missing half their brain, but these bindings suck ass, so let's change them. For starters, bind your movement to WASD so you can control your character like a normal human being, and make sure that S and D are the keys for strafing, or as the game calls them, slide left and slide right. Set running to left shift, and rebind the cast spell option to tab instead of backspace so you can keep your right hand on the mouse while in combat. 
You can change the jump key to spacebar if you want, but my spacebar was bound to the activate central cursor key, so that's how I interacted with items. You could bind that to your mouse's left click if you want, but I didn't bother trying. Jumping isn't something you do a lot of in this game until the final dungeon anyway, so it wasn't really a problem, at least not for me. Then, rebind any conflictions when necessary, and congratulations, you've just 2021 anized a game from 1996. I can guarantee you that I would never have been able to get through 90% of the game's combat encounters if I hadn't changed the controls. I should mention that there are a lot of people who do prefer the cursor mode, but I think most people who are already used to modern control schemes will enjoy the game much more if they don't feel like they're fighting with the controls. I'd also like to take a moment to explain my method of saving the game, because it's more important than you think. Due to how difficult this game can be, it's important to save as often as humanly possible. If you don't make a habit out of it, then you're going to be frequently losing progress, and nobody wants to constantly get set back while exploring a dungeon, especially some of the later ones that take a lot of time. If you're playing Daggerfall Unity, then you don't need to worry about micromanaging your saves because you have infinite save slots, but for vanilla Daggerfall, you only get 6. I mainly want to share this because I feel like it'll help somebody down the line who does decide to try vanilla Daggerfall. While you wouldn't just play Daggerfall Unity, I don't know, but I'm sure you have your reasons. My first two saves are the only ones that aren't dungeon related. The first save is basically the primary save slot I use anytime I return to town or complete a quest. The second one is placed before I accept a quest so that if it turns out to be bugged, I can reload and get a new one without constantly lowering my reputation by failing it. Bug quests can sometimes persist indefinitely because the command to terminate it after the allotted time fails to execute, so there was at least one quest in my quest log that I couldn't complete and forgot to save before taking that was there for the rest of my playthrough. The final four saves are all dungeon related. The first one is placed outside the dungeon entrance in case something goes horribly wrong and traps me inside, which is a bug that can happen with specific fighters guild quests that I never ended up taking. Regardless, it never hurts to be prepared. The next one is a checkpoint save placed at the dungeon exit anytime I make my way back there, usually whenever I'm returning to my wagon to dump all the loot I'd acquired before heading back to explore more areas. The third save, entitled Dungeon Progress, is a regular save that I make after each combat encounter to prevent me from losing too much progress. Believe me, you don't want to spend 15 minutes mapping out an entire wing of a dungeon just to get one shot by an enemy that was hiding behind a corner. The final save on the list, Dungeon Progress 2, is more of a free space for whatever I need it to be at that moment. If I took several hits from an enemy that can easily contract diseases from, like zombies, vampires, or werewolves, then I'll save into this slot until I know for a fact that I'm still healthy. I would sometimes use this slot if I was currently doing something risky, like jumping into a trapdoor with no clear exit besides levitate, so if I end up trapping myself, I haven't overwritten my main progress save and I won't need to go all the way back to the checkpoint, since that could have been anywhere from 5 minutes ago to when I first arrived at the dungeon. This method of saving has prevented an extraordinary amount of headache for me, and you wouldn't believe how many times I've reloaded a save to get out of a bugged quest in this playthrough. The number of problems I faced the few times I didn't follow this outline says a lot about how reliant this game really is on its own save system. If you're the type of person who thinks that save scumming is an unforgivable gaming sin, then Daggerfall is a great case study as to why it can sometimes be necessary just to progress. When you're in the final dungeon of the game and the developers place to teleport in a spot that clips you through the wall and almost softlocks your game, you're going to want to reload until you manage to get free. The fact that I did it all was a miracle of Todd. With all that out of the way, you're now free to explore the dungeon proper, which means I get to actually criticize the game's sorry excuse for a tutorial. The very first thing Daggerfall does is take your dungeon virginity, and Bethesda made some decisions that are almost as questionable as that metaphor. For starters, the actual tutorial messages aren't prompted to you after you interact with a certain part of the dungeon. They're given after a certain amount of time has passed, usually one to two minutes. Ignoring the fact that this is just a stupid way to actually issue your tutorial, there are some real tangible problems with its delivery. The tutorial that shows you how to save your game doesn't come until the sixth message. If you do what I did and go explore the dungeon while waiting for these prompts to appear, you are going to die. When you die, you don't have a save to reload, so you get to go through character creation all over again. The very first time I tried Daggerfall before I'd taken the time to actually change the game's controls, I made five characters before finally figuring out how to save the game. I'll admit, this was more of a problem with me than with the game. Had I at any point hit the escape key, I would have found the option to save. But I still feel like the developers should have understood that players aren't going to swing their sword in the air for two minutes straight waiting for the next message, and the decision to issue a tutorial in this way is stupid to begin with. The game sends you prompts after interacting with objects constantly, so it's strange to me that this was the only exception. I already talked about how they don't even tell you how to open your map until after you've escaped the dungeon, but I really want to emphasize how poorly these tutorials are communicated to you. 
Looking past that, the dungeon itself has several issues, mostly regarding the enemies you find inside it. Hey guys, this is Bland Voice Post-Production Shrimp again. I went back to get footage of the game's tutorial because I apparently didn't activate tutorial messages on my first playthrough, and I learned a few more things that I didn't include in the original audio. First of all, you can actually rest to skip to the next tutorial message, so it's on an in-game timer, it's not real time. A new player isn't going to know this, and I still think it's a bad way to convey information to them. I initially went on to say that the dungeon isn't properly balanced because of the presence of high-level enemies that can kill you quickly like skeleton warriors, orcs, and imps. The imps specifically are a problem because there's one guarding the exit and they're immune to iron weapons, so you can't actually damage them with your starting gear. You have the choice of taking an ebony dagger in character creation, which is something I never did because I never had points in short blade. And I made the comment that this weapon would still be worthless if you didn't take short blade as one of your skills. Well, this is wrong. I had a short blade skill of 7% in this example and I was still able to clear the entire dungeon without dying. I'm willing to admit that some of this is due to my experience since I've already beaten the game by this point and I know how to bully the enemy AI to where they can't really hit me, so it's possible that a new player will still struggle, but this does make your experience much easier in this dungeon. I also went on to say that what I think the developers expected you to do was to explore the dungeon killing all the enemies and looting their bodies until you get a weapon of steel quality or higher, and then go kill the imp guarding the exit but I said that this is overestimating the player's ability to kill the enemies in this dungeon that drop loot. I stand by this argument because if you didn't take the ebony dagger then you're not killing shit, but if you did then this really won't be much of a problem, unless you're playing in cursor mode and you can't kite the enemy to prevent them from hitting you since they need to stop moving before they can attack. I don't really think that simply having the option to take a high level weapon and character creation automatically absolve the dungeon design from criticism. A brand new player isn't going to know these things and I stand by everything I said, but I needed to at least make it known that there are ways to get through it. I try not to keep interrupting the video, but it would be dishonest of me not to correct something that I know is wrong. Not to mention that having incorrect information in this video defeats the whole purpose of making it. Alright, normal voice shrimp is out. Enjoy reading voice shrimp for the rest of the video unless I end up needing to do this for a third time. Hopefully you can see why I think this tutorial is poorly designed and why I feel like it has some communication issues. My intention isn't to sit here and claim that the tutorial is bad because it's too hard, but rather that a tutorial should be where the player has a safe place to learn the controls so they're ready to tackle the harder areas later in the game. Now that we're done with the tutorial, let's get into some other areas of gameplay. Daggerfall is by no means a small game. I talked a bit about the level of world simulation in the game, but what I didn't mention was things like national holidays and the changing of seasons. If you find yourself in town during one of the game's many holidays, then a message will appear letting you know what's up. This usually includes benefits like temples curing diseases for free, but it can also have drawbacks like shops remaining closed all day. Of course, this just means you're free to break in and loot the place of all its valuables, so even that might be a positive to the right player. On every other mundane day of the year, you'll probably spend your time picking up quests from shopkeepers, taverns, or your respective guild. Guild. The most interesting quest I received was presented as a regular delivery job. The innkeeper didn't specify a timeline, but he said he'll pay you half the gold up front and the other half when the job is complete, and the sum is twice as much as a usual job pays. When you receive the package, you find a severed finger with a note wrapped around it. When you read the note, you learn that you've been tricked. What you're holding is a cursed mummy finger. Every night between midnight and 1am, the mummy will appear to haunt you, and the only way he could get rid of it was either to return the finger to its tomb or get somebody else to take it willingly. Since no Nobody would willingly accept a curse, he had to lie. Once you have the finger, your only choice is to find out how to rid yourself of the curse. Ask enough NPCs and you'll find the location of a particular temple, the specifics of which are randomly generated like most of the game's content. You approach them about the finger and they'll give you more information about the curse. The mummy will haunt you for a thousand and one nights unless you go to the necessary dungeon and kill it. Once you do, the curse will be lifted. The alternative is literally to just hold on to it for nearly three in-game years until the quest expires. This is a fun quest, mostly because it reminds me of that South Park episode where Butters gets cursed by a mummy and he's constantly accused of being abusive towards it. There's another popular quest that I didn't do where you're falsely accused of stealing an item which massively drops your reputation with the town you accept it from, so you spend the entire time trying to clear your name. There are quite a few quests that stand out from the usual go kill five harpies in this dungeon and come back for some pocket change. Doing quests for people increases your reputation with them, which only really affects how they speak to you. That being said, if you have too low of a reputation with someone, then they may just refuse to speak to you at all. 
The only exception to this is the guilds in some factions during the story. The guilds in this game don't have their own self-contained stories or unique quest lines. Some quests are more substantial than others, but there are only a handful of quests that could be considered a quest line, and most of them come from the CompUSA patch for the game. This was a limited edition of Daggerfall only available to CompUSA customers. Bethesda later released the content from this version as a patch for the game, but I either never installed this patch or I never saw the content. So the only thing I got out of questing for guilds is access to the the services they provide. And believe me, those were more than enough of a reward to make it worth the time investment. On my playthrough, I joined the Mages and Fighters guilds, but the UESP shows some useful services for the Thieves Guild and Dark Brotherhood, too. The various temples and knightly orders also mingle in these services, but not all guilds are equal in their usefulness. For example, the Fighters Guild only offers you training and item repair services, but they also let you sleep in the guild hall so you have a place to rest. The Mages Guild offers many more services like item identification, which is a service that appraises enchanted items because because you won't know exactly what the enchantment is just by picking one up, as well as Daedra summoning, teleportation, item enchanters, and a spellmaker. I'll circle back to those last two in a moment. The Thieves Guild offers services like a fence that you can sell magical items to for a higher price than most merchants are willing to pay, and a spy master, which sounds like the most useful service the guild offers. Normally the way you get information, be it rumors, the location of a specific person, or quest related topics, is by asking everybody you come across until you find somebody who knows something useful. Most people will tell you which direction to find something in, but you have to ask multiple people until you find somebody who will mark it on your map. The spy master is somebody who always has reliable information so you don't need to bother with the vague directions of a random townsperson. The Dark Brotherhood also has access to a spy master, but they also have a potion maker, which was something that I never gained access to in my entire playthrough. I knew that potion making existed because of all the ingredients I kept finding, but I just never bothered figuring out where to craft them at. Going back to the Mages Guild, I want to talk about enchanting and the spellmaker. Crafting magical items isn't referred to as enchanting in Daggerfall, but that's probably what most people know it as. I actually prefer Skyrim having an entire skill tree dedicated to enchantments, even if the execution of the system is pretty lackluster. In Daggerfall, you have access to every enchantment immediately, but every item can only hold a certain threshold of magic. For example, some gems can hold 800 magic, while others can hold 2000, and so on. You're given six categories of miscellaneous accessories you can wear with two slots per category, resulting in a potential of 12 enchantments at once. This isn't including the shirt and pants you wear under your armor or your weapons and armor itself. There are several different types of enchantments, but the ones I got the most use out of are the cast when held category. This means that a certain spell is cast as long as I'm wearing that enchanted item, and I mostly use these to fortify my attributes. You can also enchant items to cast a spell only when you use it from your inventory. Just like your advantages and disadvantages with the character creation, you add positive and negative effects to the enchantment items to balance out the magical points that it uses. But I never bothered with this. The downside to enchanted items is that you can't repair them, so once they break, they're gone for good. So, if you find yourself in possession of a high tier weapon and there's no replacement in sight for the foreseeable future, don't enchant it if you want to keep it. RIP my Mithril Claymore. Enchanted items aren't cheap to craft either, so expect to sink anywhere from 20 to 50,000 gold just for a handful of enchantments. Don't worry, I'll talk about ways to break the game's economy in a moment. The Spellmaker is my favorite service from this game. You know how in Skyrim the only way to acquire spells is by either buying or looting them? Well, in Daggerfall and Morrowind, you're allowed to make them yourself. Oblivion reserved this feature for those who completed the Mage's Guild questline, and Skyrim removed it entirely. This really sucks, because it's the perfect way to unlock the magic system's full potential. You can add up to three spell effects on a single spell. You can set the magnitude, or damage output, as well as the duration if applicable. I never added multiple effects given my low mana pool, but I loved making progressively better fireballs as my destruction skill increased and the cost to cast them lowered. The magic system in this game is as fun or boring as you make it, and I still have fun with Skyrim's system, I just wish I was allowed to personalize my abilities a little more. You can create spells that do the same thing as the official version but more efficiently, or you can create something that costs 300 mana to cast but kills the toughest enemies in a single hit. I know they're not going to, but I really hope Bethesda at least considers adding the Spellmaker back in Elder Scrolls 6. Alright, it's time to talk about economy exploits. Let's say you decide to stop by the bank and view the houses they have for sale. A million gold sounds like an absurd amount in the early game, but it's actually quite achievable when you're consistently selling Orcish and Daedric gear. Unfortunately, you don't want to wait until level 20 to buy your house. You're sick of mooching off the Fighters Guild and you want a place to call your own. As opposed to doing anything crazy like pff, working for your money, you decide you're going to steal it. 
Breaking into a shop after hours isn't easy in the city of Daggerfall on account of all the ghosts that attack you after dark, but it's still doable. You break into a shop either after they close or before they open, and that's when you learn you don't actually need to steal anything. You can just take it. Just like everything else in this game, trying to steal an item is a dice roll that determines if you're successful, and if you're not, then you get swarmed by guards. This isn't the case if you break into a shop after hours. You can take everything without penalty as long as it's on the shelves. Trying to look inside a box that's marked as personal property will give you a prompt asking if you want to go through it anyways, and this will still call the guards if it fails regardless if there are any witnesses. So in one night, you went from having no gold to having tens of thousands of gold. There's another layer to this exploit though. If you steal everything from an armor or weapon vendor and sell it back to them, then you will gradually raise the equipment scaling. You'll start seeing more mithril, ebony, orcish, and eventually daedric gear, but it's a time-consuming process and it's more of a 1 to 10 ratio than an entire inventory of good equipment. Oh, but if this sounds like it breaks the economy, trust me, it gets better. General stores sell horses and wagons, and if you break into a general store after hours and clear out a shelf, it immediately restocks with a new horse and a new wagon. These weigh nothing in your inventory, so you're not limited in the number you can take. So here's what you do. Pull up a video of one of your favorite YouTubers, which of course should be me, and shut off your brain for half an hour while you mindlessly fall into the rhythm of clicking twice, hitting escape, and hitting spacebar. You can make as much money doing this as you're willing to spend clicking away, just be warned that there is no sell all button in the menu. You will need to manually transfer every single horse and wagon over to the vendor before you can sell it. I can already see the cookie clicker fans foaming at the mouth just at the thought of making four times as much money as the average player due to their experience in an entire game genre designed around nothing but clicking. Your mercantile skill automatically comes into play when selling items, so ignore the fact that you just handed this vendor 2.3 million gold and horses, Rick Harrison over here is only going to give you about a million for it. Needless to say, you can very easily break the economy and have more money than you'll ever know what to do with. I named my house Casa del Shrimp. There was no organic way to fit that into this section, I just wanted to share it anyways. So you're probably wondering, what do you do in the game when you're not questing, dungeon crawling, or engaging in a life of crime? Well, other than the story, nothing really. When written out this way, it makes it seem like the game doesn't have a lot of content, but that's not the case. Let's take another look at Warband. The major gameplay loop revolves around fighting, doing mundane and repetitive side quests, or partaking in wars, either by yourself or for one of the kingdoms. On paper, this doesn't sound like it has a lot of content either, but that's because it's not so much what you're doing, but how you're doing it. You're not only fighting and questing, you're growing in power and increasing the size of your party. You're going from a small group of 10 people to a small army of hundreds. The same can be said about Daggerfall. You're not only questing and dungeon crawling, you're rising in the ranks of your guild, finding better equipment, leveling your skills, and loading up on enchanted items that essentially make you a demigod. The story is structured in a way that complements this gameplay loop and incentivizes you to keep questing, keep leveling, and keep getting stronger. There's not much more I can say about the gameplay without just giving more anecdotes and talking about my personal experience with the game. It's not easy to properly convey how addictive the core gameplay loop and progression system of this game is, which is why I keep resorting to describing it in story format. And since we're on the topic of stories, let's go ahead and take a look at the game's main questline. Spoilers from this point forward and all that. Before we get into the story, there are a few things I want to mention that I haven't already. First, Daggerfall doesn't have any voice acting outside of specific cutscenes and the ghosts that attack you after dark in the city of Daggerfall. I actually prefer voiceless dialogue over voice acting, but only as long as the game is designed around it. I'm not saying that removing all the voice lines from Fallout New Vegas would immediately make it a better game, but typically when I'm playing an RPG, I tend to just read the subtitles then skip to the next voice line anyways. How much of an impact this is going to have on the experience is going to come down to personal preference, but there are some tangible problems with this system as well, although it's not so much an issue with the lack of voice dialogue as much as it is a personal problem. I have a tendency to read things so quickly that I don't give my brain time to fully process what I just saw, so I forget little things like how a word is spelled or the name of who I'm trying to talk to. This was the most common when it came to finding dungeons because you have to type the name into the travel map, and it won't work if you don't spell it properly. This is alleviated by the game's quest log that writes down your current objective until the quest is complete, although there was the occasional typo that caused me some trouble here and there. This doesn't seem like a very big deal until you get into how Daggerfall's story is told. The dialogue menu has a useful feature that I never actually used 
used where you can copy the information to your log, but most of the information you receive through the story isn't through the dialog menu, it's through a pop-up window. This means that you can be given crucial information and have no way of writing it down without physically doing it yourself. This never caused too much of a problem for me, but I did occasionally have to rewatch the footage to read what somebody had told me three days prior. I really need to emphasize that this was rarely an issue, but it was an issue nonetheless. It would actually be a much smaller problem than it currently is if you could follow the main quest continuously like you can in almost every RPG in existence, but that isn't the case. To explain what I mean, you as the player don't decide when you proceed to the next quest of the main story. As you play, you'll receive letters from various members of the three main royal families present in the game. They tell you that they have some information regarding your investigation and are willing to share it with you if you do something for them first. The main story isn't a single linear experience either. The easiest way to explain it would be to just show you the flowchart from the UESP. As you can see, there are seven optional story missions that mostly exist to give you information regarding your investigation, as well as 16 mandatory quests that make up the bulk of the story. Not every optional quest has something to say that you can't learn from another one, so you can get repeat information. I did all but one of these quests, and that's because I didn't have a high enough reputation with that royal family to trigger it before the one that comes after. Both of them were optional, and the one that did trigger bugged out in a way that confused the hell out of me, but more on that later. The segregated nature of the main story, added with the fact that there are only two quests that require you to act on your own, means that you can end up receiving the next quest in one of the chart's pathways literal days after you did the last one, and it can be hard to keep up with all the information with no reminders written down in your quest log. If you're like me and you read things and then immediately forget what you just read, you're in for a bad time. The good news is, again, this is rarely an issue, and there are very few instances that require you to act on information that you previously read. There's only one riddle that requires this in the final dungeon of the game, and if I'm being honest, I was looking up a guide to get through it because it was extremely buggy and would have taken me more time than it needed to. More on that when we get there. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started with the game's main story. After creating your character, you're greeted by your first few cutscenes. Daggerfall takes place 400 years after Tiber Septim's reign, and his heirs have allowed the Empire to be significantly weakened. The current Emperor, Uriel Septim VII, is struggling to keep the Empire together as the various provinces of Tamriel war against each other and began rebelling against the Empire. You then cut to the next scene, where the Emperor summons you in secret at midnight. He says that King Lysandus of Daggerfall died on the battlefield over a year ago, and that he was a loyal ally to the Emperor. For whatever reason, Lysandus' spirit is restless and is haunting Daggerfall with a spectral army, calling for revenge. He wants you to travel there and find out why this is happening. He also has another request. He sent a letter to the Queen of Daggerfall several years ago, and he claims that it never arrived. He describes the letter as being of a sentimental and personal nature, and he would like you to find it and burn it. He then tells you that tomorrow you'll be sailing for the Kingdom of Daggerfall. Thus beginning the tale of Salty de Shrimp, Imperial Private Investigator. This is when you're plopped into the tutorial dungeon with a message telling you how you came to be here. I already talked about that earlier, so we can skip over it. Daggerfall's story takes place in the region between High Rock and Hammerfell called the Iliac Bay, with Daggerfall proper being only one region on the map. Once you've left the dungeon, you're free to go anywhere you choose, but if you're currently doing the tutorial, then it will take you to the city of Daggerfall. Once you arrive, you'll be handed a letter coming from Breziana, an imperial spy in Daggerfall's court. She tells you to meet with her so she can tell you what she knows. Once you arrive at the meeting spot, she'll inform you that the ghosts are attacking people after dark, so you should avoid the streets at night if you're ever in Daggerfall. She also says that you should start off by investigating those who may have wronged the king. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? As far as the letter is concerned, the Imperial agent wasn't able to deliver it because of the ongoing war, so he apparently hired a courier to deliver it in his stead. He didn't have the foresight to get the name of the courier or any information on them. And we have one word for people like that. Gulag. Brizianna says that you should start off by finding out if the letter ever arrived at Castle Daggerfall at all. Then she says that she needs to leave since the royals now know she's an Imperial spy, so you won't be able to use her position to springboard into the good graces of the royal family. After this, you're turned loose and allowed to begin your investigations. Except you're not. You can quest for the royals to gain some reputation that'll help you out later, but if you think you're ready to put on your detective hat and get information on your own accord, then don't expect anything more than the aching pangs of disappointment. Believe it or not, this is actually for the best. At least at first. After all, my character doesn't even have shoes yet, so maybe getting some actual gear would be ideal. A lot of RPGs, especially ones like Skyrim and The Witcher 3, don't really give you a good chance to step away and enjoy the game's side content without breaking the immersion. They give this overwhelming sense of urgency that conflicts with the open world game design. 
Telling the player that time is of the essence every 5 seconds only diminishes the drive to side quests because if you're truly immersed in the experience, you'll find it difficult to step away from the main story. This isn't a problem I have with Skyrim, but this is something I faced during my first playthrough of The Witcher 3. This is made worse when you do complete a quest in the main story and you're told that you literally just missed your objective. This is going to happen regardless of whether you beelined it there or spent 3 in-game years doing anything else, but it still harms the immersion of the experience. Daggerfall is the opposite taken to an extreme. The game outright doesn't give you the option to pursue the main story even if you want to. If Skyrim is like a clingy ex-girlfriend who doesn't know how to leave you alone, then Daggerfall is like that friend who tells you they'll text you back and you don't hear back from them for three weeks. I actually think this is a worse approach to a main quest than making me feel like the stakes are life and death but giving me the option to ignore it. There were several moments in the early game when I was questioning if I missed something important when all I had to do was wait around for the next royal to send me a letter. And then there were moments halfway through the game when I was supposed to do something but just sat around waiting for an arbitrary amount of time to pass before I could proceed. This got so bad at one point I thought I wasn't getting the next quest because my reputation with Wayrest was too low, so I spent the next 4 hours doing menial tasks around town just to find out that my reputation was that bad because there was a specific NPC in Castle Wayrest that I was supposed to speak to and they were in a back room that I didn't know I was allowed to access. I'll go into more detail about them when we get to that story quest because it's actually a pretty entertaining story. From this point forward, I'll be describing the quests in the order that I received them. So you'll notice that not everything flows the way it would in a linear narrative, but the interesting thing about Daggerfall's quests is they feel like you're gathering pieces to a puzzle and putting it together yourself. This first quest triggers sometime after you've reached level 3. You'll receive a letter from Princess Morgaya of Wayrest. She says that she heard about your interest in the Emperor's letter and she wants you to stop by Castle Wayrest so she can share with you what she knows. Once you arrive, she tells you that she'll only help you if you deliver a letter to the leader of the Necromancers, the King of Worms. You'll find him in Scourge Barrow, which is their stronghold in the Dragontail Mountains. I seriously hope for your own sake that you didn't take a phobia of undead enemies. Morgaya also says that the Necromancers believe death to be the ultimate reward for the living instead of a punishment, so don't expect them to roll out the red carpet for your arrival. You can read the letter that Morgaya gives you, where she basically says that she's going to give the King of Worms her first, and in return, he'll help the King of First Hold on the Somerset Isles speak with his dead son, and she's using this as leverage to bribe the King into marrying her. I initially thought this meant she was going to give the King of Worms her firstborn child, but the wiki explicitly says that isn't the case, citing Daggerfall's official strategy guide. This was a detail that was supposed to tie into the sequel's plot, but it never comes up in Morrowind, probably because Redguard and Battlespire flopped, and it was either forgotten or deemed unimportant by the time Morrowind began development. I can't even remember the order I did these quests in without rewatching the footage, so I'm not going to criticize Bethesda for this one. Finding the King of Worms in Scourge Barrow is fairly simple, but you won't notice this on your first time through. There are seven caskets in the first room of the Barrow, two of which are hollow and lead deeper into the dungeon. If you take the northern casket in the middle of the room, then you'll be dropped in a room with no exit except for Levitate. There's an even further drop that also has no exit. Death traps like this are fairly common in the story dungeons, and it's a very cheap way of punishing the player for deciding to explore literally the first room of this dungeon. I think this should have just led to a longer way around so non-magic users who took this route wouldn't be stuck. Things like this can cause the player to potentially lose hours of progress over something as basic as exploring a dungeon they've never been to before. The path you want to take is the middle casket on the left. This one also forces you to jump in, but there's a tapestry that casts levitate so non-magic users can get out. Don't rely on it too much though, because objects like these tend to bug out and not give you the effect they're meant to. This entrance at least gives you a wall you can climb on, unlike the death trap from before. Finding the King of Worms isn't that difficult once you know where to go, and even if you don't, you'll find that Scourge Barrow is pretty small compared to the other dungeons of this game. It also helps that Morgaya told you that if you see the rift you've gone too far, so you'll likely know that the giant trench making up the second half of the dungeon isn't where you need to go. The door leading to the King of Worms is locked, so if you don't have any magical or lock picking abilities then just hit the door until it opens. Modern Elder Scrolls games really should bring back the ability to just brute force your way through locked doors if you don't feel like lock picking. Once you make your way inside, you speak with the King of Worms. He congratulates you for a job well done and says that if his minions in the barrow don't kill you, then he wants you to deliver a letter in response to Morgaya's. The letter simply reads, done. Once you get back to Castle Wayrest, Morgaya is ecstatic, stating that she's now going to be the Queen of First Hold, although the engagement will likely be a lengthy one. She then tells you that the letter you're looking for is currently in the hands of Gortwog, the Warlord of the Orcs. He bought it from Daggerfall's Thieves Guild after they stole it from the current Queen of Daggerfall, Opki. I don't know how to pronounce that, and it's spelt like it should have more syllables than it does, but it's not said in-game and I'm not going to try and overcomplicate it. Morgaya says that she doesn't know why the Emperor would send her the letter, claiming that she's innocent to a fault and that the current king, Gothrid, isn't as loyal to the Empire as Lysandus was. 
She says that you should go speak with Minasera, the former queen of Daggerfall and Gothrid's mother. She also says that you shouldn't approach her directly, but rather you should start with somebody lower in the court and work your way up from there. There's a specific NPC you need to speak to in Castle Daggerfall to follow up with this lead, but she won't speak with you until you're level 5. In the meantime, you should head over and speak with Opki since she has a task for you right now. She says that her grandmother-in-law, Nilfaga, is said to be in poor health and has locked herself in her castle in the Rothgarian Mountains. Her castle isn't safe due to the number of magical experiments she's been doing since losing her mind, so nobody has been brave enough to do a wellness check. This is where you come in. Once you arrive, you'll notice that there's a magically locked door directly in front of the entrance. Clicking on the tapestry next to it has somebody asking for the password. Unfortunately for everybody, there aren't enough spaces to type Fear the Old Blood, so it looks like we're taking the long way around. This dungeon is much larger than Scourge Barrow and has the added gimmick of conveniently placed portcullises that will block your path. It can take quite a while to get through if you're not using a guide, and I know you're not using one because all my subscribers are hardcore gamers who don't need their handheld. Not at this stage of the game, anyways. Once you find and speak with Nalfaga, you can confirm that she is, indeed, still insane. She speaks Shakespearean to you with one of four possible lines of dialogue. You can essentially work out by reading it that she lost her mind after Lysander's death, but more importantly, you'll see the words door and shut up. I'm not sure if I'm smart or the fact that I read the text box so quickly that only every other word really registered with me, but if you walk over to the Lich statue and type shut up into the text box, the door opens. You'll be returning to Shadungeon several times throughout the story, so this will save you at least some time in the future. Notice I said some. Stay tuned for more. You make it back to Opki, who says she doubted she'd ever see you again and thanks you for your help, then gives you an enchanted item as your reward. After some time has passed, you'll receive another letter from Opki summoning you to Castle Daggerfall. Once you arrive, she swears you to secrecy before indulging on the details of her request. After you agree, she tells you that Minasera has been paying for the upkeep of a castle called Necromogan, complete with its own platoon of soldiers. Opki has noticed that she's been leaving with parcels of letters and returning empty-handed, so she wants you to investigate. Apparently Minasera's platoon of soldiers hooked up with the wrong kind of furries and goth chicks because there's an absurd number of werewolves and vampires in this castle. Once you find the letters, a message appears saying that they're badly burnt but some of the words can still be made out. They're basically love letters, except you do get some details about some orcish children being massacred at a point in time. Opki offers some more insight when you bring them back to her, saying it's known throughout the court that Lysandus was having an affair and Menacera's father was the king responsible for ordering the execution of the orcs. She was burning the letters out of loyalty to both Lysandus and her father. Opki makes a comment about Lysandus' loyalty to the emperor being foolish, then gives you some gold as a reward. Once you've made it to level 5, you can go speak with Sindasa, a maid in Daggerfall's court. She tells you that she's willing to give you information on the Emperor's missing letter if you help her first. Now that you're level 5, Sindasa has decided that you're strong enough to kill a single werewolf. I feel like if she would have asked me this almost an in-game year ago, she would have heard about the small army of werewolves that I killed during the last quest. Once you find and kill the werewolf, a text box appears saying that it transformed into a human who resembles Sindasa. I don't know why this happened, considering a lore book in Daggerfall entitled On Lycanthropy explicitly states that lycanthropes don't transform into their human form after death. I think this detail might have something to do with an alternative solution to the quest that you can't get working without a third party patch for the game. This involves you getting one of Sindasa's witch friends to help cure the man instead of killing him. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any dialogue from this alternative, so I don't know if it elaborates. When you make it back to Sindasa, she says that the werewolf used to be her brother and that he did contract lycanthropy by being bitten. So I'm going to chalk this one up to a lore inconsistency. It's not really a huge deal, you can find lore inconsistencies in almost any game if you look hard enough. Sindasa tells you that it's not very often they receive a letter from the Emperor considering that Gothrid doesn't care for him, but she's the one who handed it to Opki. She got excited thinking that it was for her, but it wasn't until after reading it that she realized it was for Minasera. Whatever was on the letter visibly shocked her, and she said that she would make sure Minasera received it. The next quest starts immediately after speaking with Sindasa. You have the option of speaking with Opki about the letter or going straight to Minasera. If you do decide to speak with her, she'll tell you that the letter was stolen the same day she received it, but she never actually read it. Apparently, if you do this, you'll receive a massive reputation hit from Opki and open yourself up to getting hit squads of Nightblades sent after you. Additionally, the Castle Guards are programmed to attack anybody who enters restricted areas, which apparently includes Minasera's room. This happens every time you go to speak with her, which got annoying after a while. Once you do decide to speak with her, she says that she wants you to investigate Opki and that she's been suspicious of her loyalties to the Emperor for some time now. You learn that she is the daughter of King Cameron, who's the former King of Sentinel. Both Lysandus and Cameron died at the Battle of Kringane Field during what's referred to as the Betany War, which was the most recent conflict in the Iliac Bay's history. 
What's important is that the Emperor's Courier is a member of the Knights of the Dragon, so you'll need to track them down and find out what happened with the delivery. The Order's Dispatcher reluctantly gives you their whereabouts, warning you that the Courier disemboweled the last person who tried to ambush them. Once you meet the Courier, they tell you that the letter was simply addressed to the Queen of Daggerfall, and Opki is the Queen. So they give you the token they received after delivering the letter. I'm not sure if they received this token from Sandasa, which would be weird because why would a maid be handing out rewards? But if not, this implies that they gave the letter to Abki directly, which we know didn't happen because Sandasa just told us that she handed it to her, so... Yeah, there are a lot of little inconsistencies like this in Daggerfall, and I'm not going to remark on any more of them because they're very minor and not relevant to the plot. What actually happened, as Minasera confirms, is that the letter was sent before Lysanda's death, but it didn't arrive until afterwards. She also tells you that she doesn't trust Abki, and that she intercepted a letter from Morgaya claiming to know more about the Emperor's letter. She mentions that the Wayrest royal family hates living under the Emperor's rule, then tells you to return to her once you learn anything about the letter. As it happens, we know that Gortwog is currently in possession of it, so speaking with Minasera again will start this quest. She tells you that Gortwog desperately wants to be recognized by the Empire. At this point in the Elder Scrolls lore, orcs are considered nothing more than savages and are currently enemies of the Empire, so all orcs you meet in this game are immediately hostile. Minasera hands you a letter for Gortwog saying that she'd like to support his claim for orcish sovereignty, but she needs the Emperor's letter if she is to remain in his good graces. You make it to his castle in the emancipated lands of Orsinium. As opposed to doing something trivial, like just giving you the letter, Gortwog tells you to go find it yourself, seeing that he'll consider you worthy if you manage to survive. This is yet another dungeon crawl, but I'd rather fight orcs all day than undead. You get a chance to read the letter after finding it, where you learn that something called the Totem of Tiber Septum was recovered, and it's currently in the possession of Lord Woodborne of Wayrest. He asks that Minasera use her influence to convince him to hand it over to either her or Brisiana. It isn't clear exactly what the totem is right now, but Minasera seems to think it's dangerous. She says that Gorwag no doubt made copies of the letter and sold it to everybody from Wayrest to somebody named the Underking. She then says that the only safe place for the totem is in the hands of the Emperor and sends you on your way. I like the way that the plot points behind this letter are set up, because it makes you think you're going to learn about some boring love affair that the Emperor had, only to find out it was all misdirection. Several quests can trigger at this point. You'll receive a letter threatening your life if you don't stop the investigation into Lysandus' ghost, telling you that you're being watched. Considering we just got back from a castle full of orcs, this is more likely to make you laugh than actually scare you. You'll also receive a series of anonymous letters explaining what the Totem of Tiber Septum is. There are three in total, and they all trigger depending on your reputation with certain factions. I only received the first and third letters, but just like everything else in life, you can find the information online. The first letter talks about the legend of the Numidium, which is described as a giant so big it could knock the moon out of the sky with its hands. There's some truth behind this legend. The Totem of Tiber Septum is used to control the Numidium, but it won't operate today because it lost something called its Mantellan Heart during the final battle with Tiber Septum's Battle Mage. The letter says they don't know exactly what the heart is, but unless you find it, the Numidium will remain dormant and the totem is useless. The second letter gives much more detail. It says that the Numidium was Tiber Septum's secret weapon while he was conquering Tamriel. It's a thousand foot tall automaton, so either a golem or an Atronach, and is powered by a gem called the Mantella. The Mantella is infused with the life force of Septum's Imperial Battle Mage, and after he learned that Septum was using the Numidium to wipe out all the neutral royal families who didn't partake in his war simply because they were loose ends, the Battle Mage was none too happy about it. He began fighting back to regain control of the Mantella, and in the ensuing battle it got blown into an alternate dimension called Aetherius. Numidium's body was scattered throughout Tamriel, and Septum's battle mage fell into a semi-coma after losing his life force. The battle mage became known as the Underking from that point forward. Over the generations, the Septum dynasty has sent out elite soldiers to find and recover pieces of the Numidium, and these soldiers became known as the Blades. Meanwhile, the Underking sent his forces out to find and recover the Mantella. The letter concludes by stating that whoever finds the Totem of Tiber Septum controls the fate of Tamriel. The third letter is much shorter and talks more about the totem itself. The totem was crafted by the Underking when he was still Septim's battle mage, and he placed a seal on it that anybody who wasn't of Septim lineage or possessed a supernatural affinity for magic would be killed if they tried to activate it. This is going to be directly contradicted by the end of the game unless there's something crucial that I'm missing. Let's go ahead and move on to the next quest. Sometime after reaching level 5, you'll receive a letter from Prince Loden of Sentinel. He says that Lysandus and his father were somewhat close, and he might be able to shed some light on the Daggerfall hauntings. When you find him in Castle Sentinel, he says he knows something about Lysandus that might explain why he's haunting the town, but in typical Daggerfall fashion, he won't help you unless you help him. 
He tells you that he used to have an older brother, about 10 or 11 years older than him. The name of this brother is Random, but the canon name is Arthago. Anytime he asks what happened to him, he gets told a different story. Some say he was kidnapped by the Underking, others say that he got sick and died. He wants to know what really happened, and in return, he'll tell you what he knows. A new topic comes up in the dialogue menu regarding Arthago, or whatever name the game assigned to him. You can learn through this that he was always more of a scholar than a warrior, and this angered King Cameron. You can also learn that he was the only member of the royal family to never receive a public funeral. After investigating for a while, you'll receive an anonymous letter telling you to meet them at a tavern to learn the truth about the prince. After finding and speaking to the person, he tells you that the Underking is being wrongfully accused of kidnapping the prince and tells you to go check out one of two dungeons, Castle Fallum or the Fortress of Fosium. Just like anything else in the game, which fort you get sent to is randomly assigned. Your mysterious contact refuses to tell you who he is and says you can just refer to him as a loyal servant. I either didn't put two and two together my first time through, or these details aren't as obvious in game as they are on paper. I'll hold off on the bombshell for those of you who don't see the connection yet. After crawling through your respective dungeon, you'll come across some notes entitled Death Certificate. This is a handwritten account of the events leading to Arthago's death, which he claims to have left behind in hopes that it would be found and shared with the rest of Sentinel. The note is rather long, so here are the main points. Arthago was 15 when he was seized and sealed away in this dungeon. He had been in poor health his entire life, and he received little affection from his parents. They viewed him as an embarrassment of an heir to the throne and focused their attention more on their other children, namely Abki, Greklith, and Loten. Arthago says that Loten's name puzzled him since it translates to second boy, even though he would have been the third, and only in hindsight does he realize that he had been disinherited. For the last three years, Arthago had been deathly ill, but he was able to gradually recover. He could tell by the expression on Cameron's face that he was disgusted that he even survived, and three days later, he was seized and locked in this dungeon. After freeing himself from his bonds, he realized that the place was full of undead creatures and he has no hope of escaping. His only regret is he had spent so much time studying history instead of magic, because he could have at least saved his life by turning himself into a lich, but since he didn't, he's leaving this behind as a historical document. At this point, you can deliver the note back to Loden. Alternatively, you can deliver the note to Queen Akarithi, Prince Greklith, or Lord Vosik, all of which will accuse you of drafting a counterfeit to use as blackmail. This nets you no reward, fails the quest, and severely drops your reputation in Sentinel, so this isn't really an option. After giving Loten the notes, he tells you that Lysandus was in love with his court sorceress, Medora Dureni. During the Bentany War, Minasera found out about the affair and banished Medora from the court. He says that Medora has a castle somewhere on the Isle of Balfiera, but there's some sort of curse that's preventing her from ever leaving. At this point, you're meant to go do your own investigating to find this castle, which isn't hard due to the few number of dungeons on the Isle, but my Mithril Claymore broke a while back and this Dwarven Daikatana is a less than worthy replacement, so my first attempt at exploring the place ended in me getting ass blasted by a half Half naked Daedra. Ugh, that sounds sexual. You need a weapon of mithril quality or higher to hurt them, and sadly for me, all I have is a dwarven weep stick. So until I can find an actual weapon, this quest needs to be put on hold. I actually thought it wouldn't matter if I explored the dungeon since nobody sent me here, so in my mind that meant the quest objective wouldn't spawn. Let's move on to something easier. You'll eventually get a note from Princess Elisana from Wayrest telling you that she heard of your reliability from her friend Lord Woodborne. She wants you to stop by and do a job for her. After you arrive, she begins sweet-talking you and says that a contact of hers knows something about the totem you're looking for. The contact's name is... Princess Elisana. The objective is in the Daggerfall region, so I assumed this was just a common name for royalty or something. She wants you to escort her cousin to this contact in a random town. Well, I arrive at the location, and standing before me is... Princess Elisana, the quest giver. She seems surprised to see me, which I found odd, she's the one who sent me here. Then she proceeds to tell me that she knows nothing about any totem, and runs off. I was very confused about this quest until I looked it up. Remember that letter we got threatening our life? That was sent to you by Lord Woodborne. It's easy to remember that he's the one in possession of the totem of Tiber Septum since I just talked about it a little while ago, but it's also easy to forget while playing the game normally unless you have good memory or wrote everything down. You're supposed to get attacked on occasion after receiving the letter, but that didn't happen to me. After a while, you'll get a letter from Elisana continuing the quest, and if you accept this job from her, then you take a massive reputation hit in Wayrest, something that caused me hours of grief later in the game. During the escort, you're meant to get attacked by even more barbarians, and the girl you're escorting is supposed to remark that you should probably forget about Lysandus' ghost. If you kill five attackers and aren't in fast travel mode, then she says that you're much tougher than Elisana said you would be, and runs off. The contact you meet is supposed to be a randomly generated NPC, and they're surprised to see you because you're supposed to be dead. If you approach them without the escort in tow, they tell you that they were only hired to set you up, so they give you the gold reward and the bribe money they received for the job. 
This quest is actually broken for almost everyone. The UESP says that for an unknown reason, the contact will always appear as Gortwog. You know, the orc. I think this is funny because that not only means that I got the shiny Pokemon equivalent of quest bugs, it also means that I would have been confused as hell no matter what happened, and this likely would have influenced my opinion of Gortwog in the future. Consider this documented evidence that I broke the game in a way that nobody knew was possible. By this point, I thought all my leads had dried up. I didn't realize that I needed to get through Dureni Tower. Instead, I convinced myself that my low reputation in Wayrest, of which I didn't realize was due to the previous quest, was preventing me from progressing. After four and a half hours of doing every menial task for the residents of Wayrest, Todd Howard heard my prayers. During one of my quests, I encountered a zombie, which is odd because you never see them outside of dungeons. After killing it, you find a letter from the King of Worms stitched on its body. He politely invites you back to Scourge Barrow at your earliest convenience, saying to kill whatever undead get in your way because he can always reanimate them. After finishing my thousandth quest in Wayrest, just for seemingly nothing to happen to my reputation, I finally had something fun to do. This quest is triggered once you reach level 7, which I happen to do during my questing spree. The King of Worms needs something from the depths of Castle Sentinel, and in return he'll give you information that he claims only the dead can provide. After accepting, he tells you that he's looking for an answer to a question that doesn't exist among the living. He wants you to find the ghost of Prince Carolus, the great-grandfather of King Cameron. He's living as a lich somewhere in Castle Sentinel, and you're given a special scarab that should soul trap him after he's killed. In return, you'll be told a tale that few mortals have ever heard. This quest was actually fairly intimidating to me, but only because I don't have a handle on my own mind. I kept hyping up the fact that I was about to fight a lich, not knowing that I was actually more than capable of handling one by myself. I'm somewhat scarred from an experience I had sometime last year on The Witcher 3 when a level 20 Leshen followed me halfway across Velum when I was like level 9. It even followed me into an underground crypt, scaring the hell out of me before eventually dying to the gas traps that were in the room. For some reason my brain equates liches to leshens, probably because they sound similar. I don't actually know what goes on in my head half the time if I'm being honest. After solving some puzzles and finding the lich's room, I did that thing you do when you use this exploit. Cast fireballs in the doorway until you stop hearing noises from the other side. You take the soul back to the King of Worms, who may or may not imply that he's going to torture it until he gets what he wants. Then you learn about the Underking. Most of this information you got from the second Numidium letter, but like I said earlier, I didn't receive that one. The things you learn here that the letter doesn't mention is that the Underking's true name is Zurin Arctis, and the King of Worms says he has been a thorn in his side for centuries. He also tells you that should the Underking regain his mortal body, he would throw all of Tamriel into conflict. Seeing as the Numidium letter says that he fought against Tiber Septum in defense of the neutral royal families during his conquest of Tamriel, I'm not sure which account is more authentic. This next quest also triggers at level 7. Queen Akarithi has requested your presence at Castle Sentinel before the end of the next season. She says that Loten recommended you with high praise. Once you arrive, she tells you that she'll pay you to infiltrate Castle Wayrest and recover an heirloom that belonged to Lysandus. If I could actually speak for my character, I'd tell her that I would do it for free. Fuck Wayrest. That place has been nothing but a headache for me. Just when I thought I was getting back at the place for wasting four hours of my time on menial side quests, I soon learned that Wayrest had one more trick up its sleeve. The castle is one dungeon the size of four dungeons, and it took me three and a half hours just to find the painting. I ended up resorting to looking up a guide to find out what I was missing because I mapped out what felt like 90% of the place, just to find out that there's a half wall that you're supposed to jump crouch through. I thought you needed to pull a lever or something to open the way. You could probably swim to get through here since there is an underwater section nearby, but I already went into how my character never learned how to swim in his life. I'd also like to add that just in the process of trying to jump crouch through, I used levitate and I still had to clip through the wall just to get through it, so... I seriously have no idea what the developers thought you were supposed to do here or how they expected the player to figure this out for themselves. I hated Wayrest before taking this quest and the human mind cannot comprehend the amount of torture that I think it and all its citizens should be subject to for the amount of my time they wasted. I'd have them all on an express train to Necroval if I could. They deserve to take a trip through the Fly of Despair. No, worse than that, they deserve to be forced to watch the 2018 YouTube Rewind while Amy Schumer gives a live performance in the background. The only good outcome here is I found a single NPC who will talk to me so I can progress the story. Before moving on, let's talk about the painting. You can examine it in your inventory, and it depicts a heated debate between some men of Wayrest and a man of Daggerfall inside a tent. One of the Wayrest men goes behind the Daggerfall man and stabs him between the ribs, then the painting fades out. 
Once you return to Akarithi, she'll ask you if you observed the painting. If you say yes, which I did because I'm honest, she'll scold you and say this is a royal matter and it'll be dealt with by royalty. You get a reputation boost regardless. Unfortunately for me, it's back to Wayrest so I can do that quest I found out about earlier. This quest triggered all the way back at level 4, but the quest giver is in a back room of the castle that I only explored while actively breaking into it, so I didn't even know it was there. Prince Helseth says that he has a letter of the utmost importance that he needs delivered. In return, he'll put in a good word for you with the king and queen, and he'll give you information on your investigation. After you accept, he tells you to meet him here at the same time tomorrow. You come back 24 hours later, and he tells you that the letter is for Lord Castellian, the head of the Elder Council. He says that Castellian values his privacy, so you should expect resistance at your arrival. The UESP says that if you read the letter, then you're supposed to fail the quest, except I just waited until I was out of the castle to read it and everything worked out fine. The letter is basically meant to blackmail Castellian by telling him how some of the letters he'd been sending his sister could be considered inappropriate in the wrong context. In other words, the letters are bordering incestuous. You have the choice of bringing the blackmail to the king, although it will technically fail the quest and you won't get your reward. Daggerfall isn't too great with their alternative solutions, if you haven't noticed. Once you deliver the letter, Castellian will hand you another one, and if you read it in front of him, he calls you out for it. Thankfully, we can just reload a save when we're done. Although this letter doesn't have anything as interesting as telling his sister that he dreams of her as you would a red berry covered in cream. Once you return to Helseth, he tells you that the Wayrest royal family probably had more of a hand in Lysandus' death than they're leading on. Advisors were sent to Lysandus and Cameron before the Battle of Kringane, and the official story is that they never arrived because they were attacked by orcs. Helseth has heard stories that at least some of their advisors made it to Lysandus' tent and spoke with him. He also says that Lysandus was disgustingly loyal to the Emperor while Cameron was fighting for autonomy, and then tells you that if he learns anything else, he'll reach out. Sometime after reaching level 8, you'll get a letter from a servant of the Underking asking for assistance. They say that Queen Akarithi spoke highly of you, so that's why they reached out. After arriving at the designated location, you'll meet the agent. They use the same character model as the person who gave you the location of Arthago's corpse. It's not uncommon to see reoccurring NPC models in this game, but I feel like this one is intentional, and this agent is meant to be the same person as before. This quest is in the same chain as that one, which only further validates it in my mind. The agent informs you that the necromancers have stolen a magical item of significant value from them. The real problem isn't the value of the item, rather that they cursed it and gave it to the blades. He says that the Underking has reason for not wanting any harm to come to the blades, so he wants you to infiltrate the castle and remove the item, then bring it back to him. I feel like this is unnecessary, because your character is also considered an agent of the blades, so it would make much more sense for you to just approach them directly and inform them of the problem. Of course, if you did this, then there couldn't be a dungeon, and we wouldn't want Daggerfall to lose a potential dungeon over something as trivial as common sense. Once you grab the item, you take it back to the Underking's servant, where he removes the curse and tells you to keep it. He then tells you that Lysandus didn't die at the Battle of Kringane. He was killed by treachery beforehand. The monument for him in Hammerfell is empty, and his remains were secretly buried at a tomb in Menevia. He says that he doesn't know who killed him or why he's haunting Daggerfall instead of the battlefield, but he lets you know that you've earned the gratitude of the Underking. After a while, you'll receive a letter from Queen Baron Zaya of Wayrest. Yes, that Baron Zaya. Or in my case, I approach her looking for work and she assumes that I was responding to a letter I hadn't gotten yet. As is the custom of the Iliac Bay, Baron Zaya offers you some golden information if you're willing to help her take care of her problem. She tells you that a disgruntled scribe of hers wrote an unsanctioned biography that even her enemies would describe as cruel and defamatory. Since it was also critical of the Empire and the Septim lineage as a whole, the author was executed and the book was banned. Despite this, parts of the book have a tendency to resurface and one of the chapters is currently in the possession of Gortwalk, who's trying to publish it. She wants you to infiltrate a stronghold and steal the book, then bring it back to her. You have several months to finish the quest, but if you don't make it to Orsinium six days after speaking with Baron Zaya, then you'll receive a telepathic message from Gortwog saying that the necromancer stole it before you did. If this happens, which it did for me, then he wants to speak with you about retrieving it. The quest takes place before you retrieve the Emperor's letter, so Gortwog's dialogue implies that you two haven't met before now. He asks you to retrieve the stolen chapter and bring it to him. I told him yes, just so I could consider who I was going to side with further. You might think that I would be quick to side against Wayrest given how much I dislike them, but I wasn't so quick to miss up on potential plot details and wanted to know what Baron Zaya knew. Keep in mind that deciding to steal the book from the necromancers at all will cause them to hate you. 
In this case, I ultimately decided to bring the chapter back to Baron Saya, but only because I wanted the information. You head back to Scourge Barrow and turn the place upside down looking for the chapter. Or in my case, you look up a guide because you've already been here twice, and after 42 hours of playtime, you'd be forgiven for getting a little dungeon fatigue. You can read the chapter once you recover it, and it's from the book The Real Baron Zaya. This chapter details Baron Zaya's affair with Tiber Septum. Elven women become fertile later than humans do, so they never decided to wrap up his totem, resulting in her getting pregnant earlier than she was supposed to. Once Tiber Septum learns this, he forces her to have an abortion against her will. After returning to Baron Zaya, she thanks me for my service, gives me the gold, and doesn't tell me what she's supposed to. I'd like to say she did this because she's an elf, but this is actually a bug. I ended up looking up what she's supposed to say. She tells you that Gortwog is in possession of the Emperor's Letter and that it contains information about the Totem of Tiber Septum, which we already know by this point. I didn't learn until after finishing the game that this quest chain is optional and only leads back into the quest regarding the missing letter. So not only did Wayrush trick me into helping them, they also wasted even more of my time. <laughs> Oh, that's hot. At this point, there's only one quest chain left to pursue before we reach the finale. With significantly better gear and several levels under my belt, it's time to head back to Dereni Tower on the Isle of Balfiera. This place is full of undead creatures of all sort and is by no means a small dungeon. The path to Medora is pretty straightforward once you know where you're going, but if you don't, then you'll likely spend anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour trying to find her. In my case, it only took me a little less than an hour and a half my first time. Once you do find her, she tells you that she's willing to help you put Lysanda's spirit to rest, but she isn't in a position to help right now. She needs to lift a curse on Dereni Tower before she can do anything, and considering she isn't allowed to leave, this means you get to be her errand boy. She wants you to go speak with Nelfaga to ask for help finding a unicorn horn that'll help lift the curse. She says that if the rumors are true and she has lost her mind, which we've confirmed that she has, then we'll have to search the castle ourselves. This means backtracking all the way out the dungeon, unless you use the recall spell, something I frequently forgot to do, and heading back to Shin Dungeon. If you figured out the password to the door during your last visit, this might save you some time, but if you didn't, you need to take the long way around to Nafaga's chamber again. I'm about to lay some very heavy criticism on the game, so I think it's only fair to mention that Daggerfall has an official strategy guide that was released at the same time as the game, so players who couldn't figure things out and didn't have any friends who knew the answer would find their answers in this book. Anytime I ask the question, how is the player possibly supposed to know this, the answer is by purchasing a copy of Daggerfall's strategy guide and reading through it. If you feel like being forced to purchase a guide to the game because the puzzles aren't communicated in a way that allows you to optimally solve them yourself is a predatory business practice, then I won't argue with you. The reality is, strategy guides were very common for games back when I was growing up, and I even remember one of my friends as far back as when I was a freshman in high school reading a Skyrim strategy guide in class, which is the last time I remember ever seeing a physical copy strategy guide in my life. It's also not really something you want to do when you constantly get bullied for being a nerd, but yeah. It's no mystery why strategy guides went on the decline after the 2010s. You can typically find guides and walkthroughs from any game's media site on the internet. Some of you may not know this, but the internet wasn't always the hub of information for games like it was today. If you got stuck in a game and you didn't own a guide, you either need to fork up the coin or figure it out. This is something I remember happening to me from my childhood as late as 2009. I know some of you guys watching are going to be shocked to hear the words childhood in 2009, but let's face it, that was 12 years ago. We're old. The point I'm trying to make is that strategy guides were viewed as a legitimate source of information for a game the same way an IGN walkthrough or fan wiki is today. I'm not going to go easy on the game just because of the existence of strategy guides, but I want it to be known that there were answers for the problems I encountered, so it's not like the guys at Bethesda just hung the player out to dry. They only hung the player out to dry if they didn't have any money. With the short trip down Nostalgia Lane out of the way, let's get into the criticism. You may recall earlier in the video when I said the developers of this game weren't very good at communicating things to the player, and this was the quest where I began to realize that. Whenever I heard people complaining about Daggerfall's dungeons taking them hours to get through before realizing their objective was behind a hidden door, I sometimes think that they're referring to this quest specifically. Recall how I said that almost every hidden doorway is displayed on your map. There's one exception to this rule that I found, which is present during this quest. I mapped out 99% of this dungeon looking for this unicorn horn before looking up a guide to see what I was missing, and I was incredibly frustrated when I realized why I couldn't find it. There's a dead end hallway containing a secret pathway that also contains a hidden room. You need to activate a torch at the start of the hallway that moves the wall so you can retrieve the horn. 
There are several problems with this, all of which have solutions that are so obvious I would think a bug is preventing me from getting a hint, but nothing is listed on the UESP, which means there's probably nothing in-game to help you out here. There are multiple common sense solutions that could have prevented this problem. For starters, the devs should have known that dead-end hallways in a labyrinthian dungeon aren't uncommon, so they could have used the texture usually associated with walls that move. This is a lighter beige color that stands out from the other textures. Just for the record, there is already one of these walls in the dungeon. Alternatively, they could have done something like make the torch a different color, maybe a slightly darker orange or yellow that is just noticeable enough to catch if you're paying attention. These are the weaker solutions, but they still would have worked. The better ones include giving Nofaga unique dialogue when asked about the unicorn horn that will hint to the player that a torch is involved in the puzzle. As it stands, asking her about the horn warrants the same generic response you can receive from any other NPC in the game. The final solution would be simply to remain consistent with every part of the game and make it obvious that there's a hidden pathway behind this wall. Every other hidden wall, aside from doorways, shows on the map that there is something behind it, including a secret cave wall in Scourge Barrow when looking for the stolen chapter. You can see that the floor continues behind the wall, which tells you that it's not a dead end. This wall in Shadungeon is the only one in the entire game that I encountered that doesn't do this, which means that even if I did manage to find it just fine, I would criticize it anyways for being inconsistent with the rest of the game. The fact that I resorted to looking up a guide after mapping out damn near the entire dungeon only solidifies that this puzzle was poorly thought out, although not as bad as some of the puzzles at the end of the game. Once you retrieve the horn, you go back to Dureni Tower, and I hope you remember the way back to Medora because every enemy respawns after you leave. She thanks you for bringing her the horn and helping lift the curse on her tower, then gives you a reward. You now need to wait 30 days for her to contact you before proceeding. She'll send you a vision explaining that she discovered something called the Dust of Restful Death that can be used to ease Lysanda's soul. She says that Gortwog has it, because of course he does. Why wouldn't the Orcish Warlord have access to every crucial plot-related item in the game? You travel to Orsinium, and he tells you that he's willing to help, but only because he respects Lysandus memory. He then tells you to tell Medora that the price of the dust is his claim to the heart, claiming that she'll know what it means. The dungeon is randomly selected from the ones on the Isle of Balfiera, and you'll find the dust on a mummy. The dust is being carried in a parchment that is partially illegible, but you can make out enough to see it's a letter from Gortwog to Medora. He claims that the people of Wayrest intend to kill somebody, presumably Lysandus, and that he's sending a squad of orcs to stop the assassins. He claims that if the Empire finds out that he attacked royal advisors of Wayrest, then he'll lose his chance of ever gaining sovereignty for his people. From here, you just need to return to Dureni Tower. You would have thought that lifting the curse on the tower meant no more undead walking the halls trying to kill you, but we wouldn't want Daggerfall to miss the chance to send you through the same dungeon for a third time. Medora tells you that she never received the letter, but Gortwalk had informed her afterwards that his orcs died trying to stop the assassins. She wants to find out why King Edward of Wayrest would commit treason by assassinating another king, even if he's never been loyal to the Empire. She then tells you that she needs a month to prepare the dust, so come back in a month for further instructions. After a month passes and you perform your fourth or fifth trek through Dureni Tower, she tells you to take the dust of restful death and sprinkle it around Lysandus' corpse. She says that this won't put him to rest, but it will calm him enough to let you speak with him. Only he can decide what will put him to rest permanently, but the first task is finding his body. Medora doesn't know where he's buried, but she does know that it's not in the monument in Kringane Field. Thankfully, we learned from the Underking's servant that Lysandus is buried in a tomb in Minevia, so we can go there now. The way to Lysandus' corpse is fairly elaborate, at least compared to the other objectives so far. After you finally make your way to his casket, you interact with it and... nothing happens. See, what's supposed to happen is that you get a cutscene showing Lysandus' ghost appearing and telling you to go kill Lord Woodborne so he can have his revenge. But there's an issue with DOSBox that just doesn't play the cutscene. Lowering the CPU cycle supposedly helps, but this didn't fix the issue for me. There are no HD videos of this cutscene that I can just rip from YouTube, but trust me, you're not missing much anyways. From your quest log, you'll learn that Lord Woodborne is betrothed to Princess Elisana, hence her trying to have you killed for investigating Lysandus Ghost. You travel to Woodborne Hall, ready to murder a murderer. You travel the halls until you finally find your target, and you learn that Lord Woodborne is a woman. The randomly generated NPC assigned to him happened to be a female barbarian, and this was far more amusing than it had any right to be. After slaying Lady Woodborne with a single fireball, she says with her dying breath that it's all up to Guthrid now, and you get a brief cutscene that shows Lysandus and his ghostly ghost pirates leaving Daggerfall for good. It's actually a very abrupt resolution to the entire premise of the game. There's also an alternate conclusion to this quest that I didn't know about. If you don't want to kill Woodborne yourself, you can find his diary, where he admits to killing Lysandus and his plans to use Zerp to throw away rest by executing Helsith and Baron Zaya after Edward dies. You can also learn that Lysandus is allied with Gortwog, whereas Gothrid is allied with Woodborne. 
You can bring this letter to anybody you think should have it. If you take it to Akarithi, then she basically calls you an idiot and does nothing with it, which means you fail the quest. If you give it to Minasera, Medora, or Nalfaga, then one of them goes to kill Woodborne in your stead. If you give it to Baron Zaya, Edward, or Helsith, then they have Woodborne arrested and executed for treason, then give you a large amount of gold for the information. If you give it to Gortwog or the King of Worms, then you receive some gold, but can't complete the quest because Woodborne still lives. Lastly, if you give it to Gothrid or Opki, then they thank you for being a moron and order their guards to kill you. It's a shame that you can't murder monarchs in this game, because these people give me fantasies of regicide the likes of which I've never had in my life. After you've completed this quest, you've entered the final stretch of the game. You'll receive a letter from Brezienna as long as you've retrieved the Emperor's letter from Gortwog, gotten the Lich's soul for the King of Worms, and laid Lysanda's spirit to rest. You meet with her at a random tavern like before, and she tells you that the totem a Tiber Septum was located, and Lord Woodborne had it. The Blades launched an assault on Woodborne Hall and didn't find the totem, so they believe it to be in Castle Daggerfall. They don't have the numbers to assault the castle because they lost too many men during the previous assault, which means that we pulled off what an armed legion of blades couldn't. I think this says more about their incompetence than it does our power level. I know a full-scale assault on a castle is different than a single armed combatant sneaking in and rampaging through, but we literally just got done tearing ass in there and somehow the blades couldn't overwhelm whoever was left. Your job now is to infiltrate Castle Daggerfall and track down the totem, which Brezianna says should be in the treasure room. This took me longer than it needed to because the hand wheel that lowers the giant cube housing the totem was underwater. I actually had to glitch my way through this with water breathing and levitate, and I can tell by the way my character was moving that it wasn't working as intended. After you take the totem, it will speak to you and say you're unworthy. Only somebody of Septim's bloodline can carry it. In reality, anybody of royal descent can use it, which makes me wonder why this detail exists if it's only going to be ignored. You'll begin receiving letters from the royals you have a positive reputation with and assassination attempts from the ones you have a negative reputation with. Akarithi claims that Wayrest and Daggerfall aren't loyal to the Emperor, and so she is the only person you can trust with the totem. Edward gives you no good reason to give him the totem, and he tries to kill you whenever you do. Gothrid sends his goons to take the totem from you, but you can return it to him yourself for a reward. The King of Worms will send you a letter saying that the royal families can't be trusted because of their greed. He has no earthly desires and wants to get rid of the totem to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands, saying that he'll make you famous if you help him. Gortwog tells you that he only really wants to create a homeland for the orcs that will be seen as equal in the eyes of the Empire, and he needs the totem to achieve this. The Underking claims that he created the totem and the Numidium, and his life force powers them, so he's its rightful owner. He says he has no interest in mortal affairs, but doesn't say what he plans to do with the totem either. The final option is to give it to Brezienna to give to the Emperor. As opposed to just telling you who I sided with and moving on, let's take a moment to look at all the clues we've been given so far and figure out who is the most worthy. The conspiracy to kill Lysandus is one that implicates every royal family in the game. Lord Woodborne may have acted on his own accord, but Wayrest still openly opposes the Empire and several of their advisors accompanied him to assassinate Lysandus. Gothrid is allied with Woodborne, and Opki is very vocal about her opposition of the Empire. Akarithi claims that she's loyal to the Empire, but Cameron was the one fighting for autonomy during the Betany War. So while it's possible that she is loyal, her husband wasn't, and we can't trust her to be telling the truth. Even if they are, they still sent their son to die just because they thought he would be too weak to lead when there were probably other solutions. So they're still not very good people. I don't think any of the three royal families of the Iliac Bay could be trusted with the totem. Gorwag was an ally to Lysandus, and he wants his people to assimilate into the Empire, so he's already much more trustworthy than any of the royals, but we still don't know if he can be trusted with an artifact as powerful as the Numidium. He's proven to be very conniving, and he's in large part responsible for the rest of the Iliac Bay even knowing about the totem in the first place. He may have good intentions now, but what about when he controls a power that can conquer all of Timriel? The King of Worms is cryptic and intimidating, but he doesn't really seem to have an agenda. His necromancers haven't openly attacked you at any point in the story, but they have taken moves towards hurting the blades by giving them a cursed item. We don't know if that command was given by the King of Worms, or if it was a sect of his followers acting on their own, but even if he was behind it, you can't deny the logic in his words. He has the power to at least try and conquer the region, but he's content to just sit in his barrow and study necromancy. We don't really see him do anything truly heinous over the course of the game, so just like Gortwog, I think trusting him is a risk, but far less than trusting any of the royal families. The Underking is somebody that really takes some consideration. We know that he has a vested interest in protecting the blades from harm, and we 
we know the reason he's a lich is because he fought against the Numidium to protect the neutral royal families of Tamriel during Tiber Septim's conquest. Other than being a nuisance to the King of Worms, which may or may not be a bonus depending on your perspective, we don't see the Underking do anything evil. The issue is, we know so little about him, and all we know comes from legends and the word of a couple followers, and what devout follower would slander their master? The Underking seems to want the totem specifically because he's the one who created it, and that's a fair argument, but not enough motive to put Tamriel at stake for. Whether or not you're willing to take that risk depends on you. All that leaves is the Emperor, and what is there to say really? Your character has a written background detailing how you befriended the Emperor, he sent you here to put a ghost of one of his subjects to rest, and he is actively fighting to keep the Empire together. Giving him the totem not only makes sense from the perspective of your character, but it makes sense because every other royal family in this game has given you no good reason to side against him. I'd argue that the number of families who try to have you executed are proof enough that Uriel should bring the thousand foot tall Darwin Disher to start kicking ass. He's the safest choice for the totem, so you can probably understand why I chose to give it to him. I can see an argument for any of the others besides Daggerfall, Wayrest, and Sentinel. Once you've chosen who to give the totem to, you're told to go speak with Nilfaga, who regained her sanity after Lysanda's spirit was laid to rest. She tells you that she doesn't know who is the most worthy of the totem, but you made the choice so you can live with the consequences. She's sending you to a place called the Mentellan Crux, which is the prison of the Mentella in Aetherius. The Mentella itself looks like a giant green gem, so you need to find it and touch it in order to free it. Once you do, you'll be teleported back to Nilfaga. The Mentellan Crux is the game's final gauntlet, full of some of the highest level enemies. It's meant to be a series of puzzles building to the end, but it's also incredibly buggy and almost softlocked my game. The first room features three floating islands and a bust of a demon. You're supposed to be given levitate when you interact with the statue, but this was busted for my playthrough. On top of this, levitation doesn't even work in this room. For whatever reason, I could only float upward if I was strafing side to side or standing in a very specific spot. If you find yourself stuck, then your game is over. You can't leave the crooks until you've found the Mentella. Thankfully, I already told you how to save your game, so you can just reload a save back in Shadungeon. I ended up needing to do this so I could craft a longer lasting levitate spell, because the one I've been using all game doesn't last long enough for me to reach the spots I need to get to, again, because the room is broken and doesn't let me float. On top of this, these puzzles don't have any logical basis to them. Fly up to this island and pull a lever. Shut some of these floating doors, but not the others. Now fly down to the side of this floating floating island and pull another lever. Fly to a doorway in the uppermost corner of the room you're in and pull a series of levers that leads to another lever. Now backtrack all the way to where you started and step on a teleporter to move on. Some of the puzzles make sense going forward, like this unique perspective puzzle of a room in the shape of a crossbow that you can only see from an angled view of the map that turns out to be a riddle later on. But most of them feel like puzzles for the sheer sake of having puzzles. Some of them require you to interact with items, and some of these will teleport you into a death trap. On top of this, your movement speed is throttled the entire time because you're considered outside instead of in a dungeon. This was probably due to the number of platforming sections in the crooks, but that's a problem itself. The game's movement is archaic enough without the addition of jumping challenges. This also severely limits anybody who doesn't have a high jump skill and doesn't know how to levitate. I don't think this dungeon was designed to properly consider non-magic users, because it relies far too heavily on the use of levitate. This would be okay in a finale quest for the Mages Guild, but it isn't. There are also enemies like Daedra Lords who can nuke you from a distance, and they put an entire area full of them. If you don't have spell reflection, then you can die in 2-3 to three hits by these guys, and you're given a place to take cover, but you still need to step into the open at least some of the time in order to progress. Filling a room full of enemies who can kill you in 2 shots isn't a fun challenge or good game design, especially when these guys are out of melee range. I'll ask again, what were melee only characters expected to do here. Another problem is that the dungeon just goes on for far too long. I was using a guide to get through it the entire time and it still took me almost two hours to get through. I'm 100% willing to admit that I would never have figured out what I was meant to do in the first room of this dungeon by myself. It's possible that if the levitate from the bust had worked properly, I would have figured out that I need to start looking above me, but considering that it didn't, I can't say for sure. The worst moment of this dungeon for me was near the end. You're meant to step into this giant crossbow and interact with a nearby halberd to teleport you to the top, and a giant sword is meant to tilt your direction so you can use it as a bridge to reach the next room. The game consistently clipped me through the wall because the teleport wasn't placed in the right spot. Sometimes this killed me instantly, other times I was stuck there long enough for the Daedra Lords in the area to kill me. Sometimes the Daedra Lords would kill me before I could even get to the crossbow. This was especially bad for me because I had to use my spell points on spell reflection so I wouldn't die, and the spells wouldn't always refill enough of my mana to cast Levitate, so I couldn't use that as a means of getting free. 
I don't mind the idea of using teleports to progress through a dungeon, but if you're going to do it, then you better make damn well sure that they work properly. Thankfully, Todd Howard was with me that day, and I was able to clip myself into a spot that wouldn't kill me and climb onto the giant sword. From here, you do a little more platforming until you come to a room with a mentella, which of course requires levitate to access. A torch is supposed to give it to you, and it doesn't work. This would be the third time that I was softlocked if I was playing a melee-only character, assuming that I could have gotten through the other rooms at all. I'm going to give the devs credit for the concept behind the crooks, but the execution is terrible. I appreciate that they try to do something different, but I would have preferred a combat gauntlet to a puzzle one. Once you're ready, and if you made it this far, then you float over to the Mantella and touch it. You're teleported back to Nofaga. She's supposed to talk to you, but as you can probably imagine, that broke for me too. Thankfully, reloading a save and touching the Mantella again fixed this. She hands you the Book of Time so you can see what'll happen with the Numidium in the future. This is where you view your ending. The ending is like 5 seconds long and just as abrupt as the conclusion with Lysandus. After viewing your ending, Nofaga tells you the password to her door in case you didn't figure it out your first time here. From here, you're free to keep playing, but that's the end of the game, so let's discuss the different endings you can get. There are 7 possible endings to the game, and each one except for the King of Worms shows the Under King rising out of his crypt to reclaim his heart so he can find Finally die. If you gave the totem to Daggerfall, Sentinel, Wayrest, or Gortwog, then they use the Numidium to destroy the others and become the dominant power of the Iliac Bay. If you give it to the King of Worms, then he uses the power of the totem to ascend to Godhood, then discards of it into Aetherius like he said he was going to. The Underking only uses the totem to reclaim his heart so he can die. The Emperor will use the Numidium to suppress all the ongoing revolutions across Tamriel and put the Empire back in order. You're probably wondering which ending is canon going forward, and the answer is all of them. Bethesda has a policy where they don't pick one ending to be considered canon because that defeats the purpose of giving the player a choice, so what actually happens here is… weird. There's a phenomenon in the Elder Scrolls that's referred to as a Dragon Break, which is essentially a restructuring of space and time that allows multiple different timelines to occur all at once. The dragon part of the name refers to Akatosh, which is the dragon god of time. The events of Daggerfall's endings are detailed in a lore book called The Warp in the West. On the 9th of Frostfall, 417 years into the Third Era, Dragon.exe stopped working and there were a series of cataclysmic events that happened at the same time. Several Agents of the Blades have given their account on the subject. One of them encountered a sandstorm of supernatural strength that buried him alive, and by the time he dug himself out and got back to town, it had already been besieged by Sentinel and they now controlled all of Northern Hammerfell. Another agent was blinded by a flash of heat and didn't learn until after her wounds were healed that she was caught in a three-way battle between Daggerfall, Orsinium, and Wayrest. The entire landscape was burnt to the ground in the process. The final agent talks about how he was sailing on a fair weather day when a 30 foot tidal wave came out of nowhere and destroyed his barge. He thought it was a magical attack so he began marching to Wayrest to find out what happened when he also got caught in a battle between the orcs and Wayrest. By the end of the battles, the only four standing nations were the four prominent ones in the game. They all claimed that they were simply reacting to nearby attacks, not instigating them. During this time, right around when the natural disasters hit, there was a warp in time that skipped over the 10th of Frostfall and went straight to the 11th. All the agents report somehow losing a day during their journeys, and yet all the soldiers knew the correct date. They believe the totem of Tiber Septum was responsible for these events, and whatever happened on the 10th of Frostfall subsequently caused it to disappear. To put answers more practically, there was a splinter in time that caused all seven endings to happen at once, and I think that the natural disasters were caused by the Numidium being activated. The conquest of each faction only lasted one day, and the timelines reconverged on the 11th with only the main factions left standing, likely protected by their ownership of the totem in their respective timeline. At the same time, the King of Worms ascended to Godhood, the Underking reclaimed his lost heart, and the rebellions across the Empire were snuffed. The lore book's author theorizes that your character tried activating the Numidium themselves and died in the process. The Bretons referred to this incident as a miracle from Stendar, Mara, and Akatosh to bring peace and stability to the region, which is what happened after the warp. The Blades don't believe it to be of divine origin, but the undeniable truth is that there were 44 independent regions of the Iliac Bay, and now there are four. The Numidium and the Totem have disappeared from Tamriel, and the remaining kingdoms have all sworn fealty to the Emperor. If this doesn't sound like it makes any sense, don't worry. Elder Scrolls lore is trippy and confusing at times. I actually have to hand it to Bethesda here. I really respect their decision to just brute force all seven endings as canon and somehow make it work. Dragon Breaks are a really interesting concept, and it's one of the few cases where something manages to make sense despite not making any sense. We'll likely see something similar with the Skyrim Civil War going forward with The Elder Scrolls VI. I also think this is the reason that Elder Scrolls games have so few branching choices compared to the Fallout franchise, because more choices means more Dragon Breaks, and it would start to make the whole concept feel arbitrary instead of a rare phenomenon that the inhabitants of Tamriel don't fully understand. 
And with that, we're done with the game. Playing through Daggerfall for the first time is a journey. You're likely going to have the satisfaction of feeling like you mastered the game and its world along the way, and you'll acquire your fair share of stories that are personal to you and your experience. Not everybody is going to have a story of returning to the same dungeon twice at completely different power levels, of getting lost in Wayrest Castle for damn near four hours, of discovering that the infamous Lord Woodborne is secretly Mulan, or getting stuck in a wall during the last 15 minutes of the game. These are all unique stories that I can tell from my experience with Daggerfall, and no doubt those of you who've played the game yourself have your own. This game is a lot of fun, but that's not to dismiss the moments that were frustrating. I enjoyed the core gameplay loop of dungeon crawling, but I despised many of the story dungeons. The most enjoyment I got out of the game was learning its systems and growing in power, to go from being unable to kill a rat in the beginning to slaying Daedra's with ease by the end. It's a level of progression that enemy scaling doesn't really provide, and it makes you feel like every skill you level in Skyrim is 10 more pounds of the drugger or deadlifting. Daggerfall's age definitely shows, but that's why Daggerfall Unity exists, to modernize a classic without losing the charm that made them want to play the game 25 years later in the first place. I could recommend this game to anybody who's a fan of the Elder Scrolls franchise and wants a slightly different experience than what the later games offer, but I can only recommend Daggerfall Unity. I can't say whether or not it has just as many bugs as vanilla Daggerfall, but most of the videos I've seen claim that it runs much better. And the number of game-breaking bugs that I did encounter makes it to where I can't recommend the original today. If you do decide to play the original anyways, I would advise that you check the UESP for available patches, change the game controls to something more comfortable, and get used to the frequent jump scares that come in the form of audio glitches. All in all, Daggerfall is a great game, and I completely understand why so many people hold it with such high regard, but I wouldn't go as far as to call it a masterpiece. It's successful in what it wants to be, that being an immersive RPG with heavy dungeon crawling mechanics, but it falls short in many other areas. It has an impressive level of world simulation, but the world itself is lackluster. Despite that, I think Daggerfall is going to go down in my mind as one of my favorite Elder Scrolls games to date, at least until I get around to playing Morrowind. As always, thanks for watching guys. I'm sorry that this took slightly longer than I expected it to. I already explained in the beginning of the video what happened there. I'm actually a little bit grateful that it happened to me because I honestly think this version of the recording turned out twice as good as the last. If it's any consolation, this only set me back by two days, so we're still on track for having the video out on time. The channel also surpassed 300 subs recently, which is honestly really surprising. It literally feels like just yesterday we hit 200, so gaining another 100 this last month feels like the fastest growth the channel has seen. I can't even begin to describe how thankful I am for all you guys. To everybody who subscribed since the last video, welcome to the channel. Feel free to join my Discord if you want to partake in our bi-weekly conversations. There'll be a link in the description if you're interested. Once again, thank you all for taking the time to watch this video, and I'll see you in the next one.